Um, let me introduce the very lovely Dr. Sarah Ball, who is sitting there right next to me um, in that little square with the blonde hair and glasses. And you are a... Um, it's actually interesting because when I was putting this thing out, and I was sort of adding up the years, but that you and Juliet have been um, been doing menopause for, and literally between you, it's, it's more than 50 years, I think, really, which is quite a considerable <laughs> amount, isn't it? Yeah, that, thanks for making me feel really old. <laughs> <laughs> that experience. <laughs> <laughs> which is what's it? interesting is that I when I qualified as a GP which was 2002 um I went to the first my first British menopause society conference which was a real um you know kind of a, a, a fab weekend away I think we went to Brighton mm -hmm. um so it's brilliant it was the same weekend as the women's health initiative study was launched Oh, so wow. It's like a really like ironic kind of, you know, there I was about to go, yeah, I'm going to do all about the menopause the same weekend as it all kind of crashed okay. around everybody's heads. Um, but yeah, but I'm still doing it. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, and hopefully it's sort of coming back around the other way. So do we think, because we do actually have a lot of stuff to get here, get through, and it is five past, shall we just start then and, um, and other people can join as they arrive? Um, let us do that, shall we? All right, so this is the lovely Dr. Sarah Ball, who is from Newson Health. And for those of you who don't know me, because there are a few people who've come from Instagram who do know me, but a few that um, don't, I'm Fiona, I'm a journalist. I've been doing health things for um, about 20 years since, actually since 2002 as well. That's when I left the Australian Broadcasting Corporation and went into medical publishing. So um, writing for a very long time on health things and all things related to health. Um, so shall we start and we will get underway with, I'm just actually, somebody just sent me a message saying they can't do this, really sorry, you can't find the link and that's all right because I happen to have it just right there. There you go, sent, sent and done. Um, shall we start at the very, very beginning with the definitions of what it is that we're actually talking about here, perimenopause, menopause, postmenopause, and does it really matter when we're bundling it all together with the symptoms? Of course, yes. So the menopause um, technically means the end of your periods. So um, the average age of the menopause um, in the developed world is 51. And when we have our last period, we don't actually, we can't call it our last period until we've gone a whole year without a period. So you don't know it at the time, but it's something that you look back on and go, oh, I've now gone a whole year without a period. So that was my menopause. So it's a natural process that um, humans go through. Um, and for most of us, it is something that just is a, is a gradual thing that happens um, but that's not always the case sometimes it's actually caused um, by more unnatural causes so if you have your ovaries removed for example at the time of um, a hysterectomy for example then you enter what's called a surgical menopause that's very sudden type of menopause sometimes people enter the menopause um, through treatments for other illnesses, particularly cancer treatments. So for example, if you have chemotherapy or radiotherapy, that may turn your ovaries off and they may never switch back on again. And the term, the perimenopause is the lead up to your menopause. So it's when your periods have changed from being their usual completely monthly regular self to something that's just not quite as you remember it. They might be a bit more spaced out. Your periods may be a bit more close together. They might just be a bit more erratic. They might just be a bit heavier. They might be a bit lighter, but they change somehow. And the perimenopause can happen anywhere really between roughly about four and 10 years before you actually get to your last period. So it's 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 a transition phase, I guess, is, is the right word. And the, the the real crucial importance about the perimenopause is that it creeps up on you because not that many of us are perhaps that in tune with our periods and we're very busy doing other things and we might not notice that our periods have subtly changed, but we will usually start to experience some symptoms which often go 
either unnoticed or put down to other things or ignored um, and they can be um, quite disastrous con consequences of that whether that's in your um, personal life with relationships or your professional life so it's really important that women know that they don't have to wait for their last period to say I'm menopausal now I need to do something it's a case of be prepared well in advance and then post menopause just basically applies to the whole of the rest of our life after we've experienced our last period so if I experienced my last period when I was 51 then from um, the rest of my life from then on I am postmenopausal. so it's very important that women don't think of the menopause as something you go through because you don't actually come out the other side you actually go into the menopause and you essentially stay in it you may or may not have the symptoms for all that time but your body has essentially changed into a postmenopausal woman and therefore it's something to consider for the rest of your life absolutely yes yes and that's um and it can be quite a long life but we will come back to that and how, why 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 it's important to think about what we do today about how it affects what we're going to be like in 40 years time but you mentioned there you know the pe periods being one symptom and of course i mean i you know from me i didn't really have any period changes until literally about three months before they stopped completely and that was that but there are a myriad of other changes aren't there that we should be looking about shall we run through them in, in their sort of in classes will we start with the vasomotor yeah so i what i tend to do is i tend to do the three sort of groups of symptoms there's the sort of the physical ones there's the psychological ones and then there's the sort of sexual ones which i think kind of makes it a bit easier to remember so physically and the, the most common one that most people have heard of is hot sweats and flushes and they are common they do affect probably about between 70 and 80 percent of us will have some hot sweats and flushes at some point but that maths means that about one in five women will never have a hot sweat or flush so um, that doesn't mean you can't be struggling in lots of other ways um, and hot sweats and flushes can be can be dreadful, they can be okay, and they can be not much of a problem. Um, but it is really important that women know that they don't have to be tolerated, that they can be dealt with, and it's not actually a good idea to put up with hot sweats and flushes. Um, but there's lots of other physical symptoms that often people don't ever think about as being related to hormones. So things like um, headaches are more common in the perimenopause, and about it normally actually more common in the perimenopause than the menopause but that's usually due to with fluctuating hormones things like muscle aches and pains um, general fatigue uh, fatigue is probably one of the commonest symptoms i've yet to meet a menopausal woman that, who's not treated who says yeah i've got bags of energy <laughs> um, sleep goes completely out the window the actual control of our sleep wake cycle gets um uh, affected by low estrogen levels in our brain so we tend to wake through the night um, we often itch all over because our skin starts to dry out um, sometimes quite sort of uh, un you would think unrelated symptoms but they're not unrelated symptoms things like sort of numbness in 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 hands and feet although there's lots of other causes of that sometimes it's it's menopause things like tinnitus so ringing in the ears that is sometimes related to the menopause um, so that's kind of the, the, the sort of the physical symptoms the psychological symptoms are often um, I think one of the sort of secret weapons of of the, the menopause in terms of um, maybe slightly more difficult to talk about than the physical symptoms and very often overlooked or blamed on something else usually stress or or um, all the things that a lot of women are the age of the menopause are trying to juggle at the time so anxiety is hugely common um so people that usually breeze through life have never really worried about anything are suddenly worrying about either very specific things or, or very general things so you know, might have a woman who says well i usually have to do lectures for work and suddenly i'm really worrying about it or I don't want to drive on a motorway because I'm suddenly worrying and that was never a problem before just low mood sort of flat mood um lack of joy just feeling like well 
my life is good. I seem to have everything I need. I've achieved what I wanted to do, but I'm just not enjoying it. Why is that? And that's often related to low estrogen levels. Um, things like sort of paranoia, um, low self-esteem, low confidence, just feeling generally not as good as you should be, you know, sort of that imposter syndrome sort of creeps in. Um, and it can be that you may previously have had psychological illness, anxiety or depression, um, and it, it's quite common for it to come back around the menopause, but you may have never struggled at all, and then you're suddenly not feeling at all yourself. Um, and so psychological symptoms are really, really important to recognize um, because if you don't recognize it yourself and make the link that this could be your hormones, it's highly unlikely anybody else will. Um, Which I guess is why we see so many women put on antidepressants as opposed to, to getting HRT. Yeah. And then there's the symptoms which very few people ever want to talk about or offer which is usually um more sort of uh sexual um and sort of genital type symptoms so often um dryness or discomfort in the vagina or even sort of dryness or itching around the vulva which is like the external genital area um which can make sex very painful it can also cause problems with the waterworks so we can find ourselves running to the loo in a real hurry and not making it in time or just having to go really often or getting lots of bouts of cystitis getting up at night to wee or lots of urinary tract infections um, and all of those things are really 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 common um, with the menopause in fact probably 80 percent plus of us will at some point between our perimenopause and the end of our life experience some of those symptoms and very infrequently is it actually put down to the menopause and dealt with appropriately which is purely just to replace the hormone that you've run out of yeah so, it's yeah. interesting actually because i had a, um, a, a a woman arguing with me the other day on um on my facebook page actually <laughs> quite vehemently i will say and then she at the bottom of said and don't ever contact me again i said and i was saying you do know you're on my page <laughs> <laughs> but that aside, um, you know, she didn't believe that stress, urinary incontinence um, um, could actually be a reason why we in later, later in life end up in a nursing home. But it is one of the reasons, you know, our inability, incontinence is a major reason for people ending up in a nursing home. Yeah, and we often will blame if we've had children, we'll often go, well, you know, what do I expect if I've pushed these big babies out? Um, and actually, yeah, that doesn't help. But actually, our pelvis is really a big sort of uh, bowl, like a sling um, of, of muscles and ligaments um, and, and skin and cartilage and all sorts of elastic -y fibers. And without estrogen in them, that elastic doesn't work anymore. So um, our, our bladder control is usually far worse. So it's, um, yeah, it's really good when we, when we see people that maybe don't, didn't particularly think that their waterworks was a problem and that then you treat their other menopausal symptoms they go oh actually yeah I haven't been running to the loo um so it's yeah it's, it's really important that we talk about these things it's women have been sort of um made to put up and shut up for too long and actually uh, most of their symptoms are completely dealable with if somebody recognizes them and that is the issue really, isn't it? I know we've talked about this before, this joining of the dots. And I guess, you know, a lot of, you see again and again, and again you know, pe people saying my GP didn't notice this or whatever it is. But it, I guess in a 10 minute consultation, it is extremely hard to know that all of these 15 things may actually be related to one. So is there a tool that, that women can take with them or um, like the climactic sheet or something that they can fill in and go in there and say, look, these are my symptoms. This could they yeah. be related so, so back in i think it was the 1970s there was a, a questionnaire um a very simple questionnaire called the green climacteric score that was developed um we've actually adapted it slightly so it's on our um the menopause doctor website and if you type questionnaire into the search box it comes up so we've adapted it because it didn't used to have uh urinary or vaginal symptoms on there which again is probably hardly surprising because women were never encouraged to talk about those things, but actually they are one of the commonest symptoms. So, um, yeah, so it's really useful. It, yes, you know, GP, the life of a GP is extremely difficult. And actually, 
um, 10 minutes is, is insufficient for many, many, many things. And the menopause is at the top of that list, I would say. So the more help you can give your GP in, if you've joined the dots, it's a lot harder to assist the GP to join the dots. And that's a very easy questionnaire to use. Tick, just tick some boxes um, and um, it will help focus. Yeah, exactly. All right. Now, then that leads us to the gold standard treatment, which is HRT. And by the way, let me preface this before. I mean, I know we are going to spend a lot of time talking about HRT here. I am not here to say you should be on HRT, but I really do want you to have informed enough information to have an informed choice about whether or not you do or you don't want to take it. So the gold standard treatment is HRT. So what exactly is it, Sarah? And, um, and how does it work? And sorry, and just a question in the chat from Dawn Tati. Yep. Could my 84 year old mom who has constant UTIs and incontinence be helped by hormone replacement therapy? Thank you. Yes, almost certainly. Um, certainly, um, I mean, we'll talk about the different types of, of hormones, but there's essentially two different types. There's what we call systemic HRT, which means the hormones are shared around your whole body. Um, and then there's what we call localized HRT, which is where the estrogen is just used in the vagina for the purpose of the vagina and the bladder. So for much older women, um, the localized estrogen is usually extremely successful um, and really carries no risks at all. So yes, it's, it's a very common thing to do with older ladies. Um, but yes, yeah, so HRT is, um, stands for hormone replacement therapy. And so it's very, um, a lot of people think, why, why are we just saying, why is Fiona just instantly said, well, you know, that the best thing to use is, is HRT. And it's really that it is the most natural thing to use HRT because it is just a replacement of your own hormones. So in the same way as if you had an underactive thyroid gland, you would be given thyroxine, which is the, the hormone that your thyroid has stopped making. And if you were diabetic, you would be given hormones to replace the hormones that you were no longer making. So actually, HRT is, is simply a replacement for your own hormones. Um, so it is by far the most successful treatment for all of the symptoms. Um, but it also because it's it is actually replacing what you've lost rather than just dealing with the symptoms in an indirect way, it helps not only your current symptoms, but it also helps your future health. And so the menopause very much is like a, a halfway reevaluation of your life and your health. And we know that without oestrogen, we are more prone as women to develop heart disease and osteoporosis and dementia. And if we replace our hormones, then we will give ourselves a protective benefit from those things. So that's why HRT should be considered first line for the symptoms of the menopause. Um, but that's not to say there aren't other options. And certainly we should be very mindful of our lifestyle in general and thinking very carefully about what we're eating, about whether we're sleeping or not, about how much exercise we're doing, about whether we do sort of relaxation. Um, so all those things are very important, but without the hormones that we no longer make, we will struggle to get the best improvement. Yeah. And now, speaking of, of HRT then, and going back to 2002, when you first started out at your first British Menopause Society conference, um, what do we know about its safety? Because there obviously has been a lot of controversy that makes people very reluctant and reticent to even countenance it as a treatment. Yeah, so we've spent the best part of 20 years now trying to crawl back really from the damage that was done to HRT when it was announced to the world that it was um, dangerous, um, that it caused heart attacks and that it caused strokes and that it caused breast cancer. Um, none of those statements are actually true. Um, those statements were based on a big trial that was done that was not designed very well and that was very flawed in terms of the numbers and the statistical analysis that was done. So if you actually go back to all the data now and reanalyze it, actually there were no increased risks of HRT except for 
than increased risk of blood clots. But blood clots only happen when you take your HRT, the oestrogen part of your HRT orally, which that is still available these days, oral oestrogen, but it's not a common or popular choice. We certainly don't use, very rarely prescribe oral oestrogen. Um, so the study that was done was based on older fashioned HRT. In fact, it, they used the pregnant horses urine HRT and what we call synthetic progestogens. So both of those things are very helpful to women and actually would have saved many, many women way back when they were really popular in the sort of 1990s. But we have very much superseded them now. And so even if that study had actually correctly proven there was any risks, we still, it still wouldn't apply to today because we've got safer HRT, but actually the, the, the numbers were wrong anyway, and it actually still showed far more benefits than risks anyway. But we now very much use what we call body identical HRT. So rather than the HRT coming from pregnant horses, we or, or, or uh, made synthetically, we now, the best type of HRT available comes from plants, it comes from the yam plant, um, and it is molecularly identical to what our ovaries make naturally anyway. So it's actually a class of its own really, and it's a much safer class, and it really is a top up to what your body used to make. So in the same way as you would take your car to the petrol station and fill up when you're running low, it's really no different if you use body identical HRT. So not only do you get improvement in symptoms, but you also get the future health benefits as well. Yeah. And coincidentally, I have this nice little chart here, which um, runs through the risks of, um, of HRT with the modern types. And it's probably very hard for you to, to see it. So I shall, I'll read it for you if you wish. Um, so this is from the Women's Health Concern, which is the patient arm of the British Menopause Society. And what it talks about is the difference in breast cancer incidence per 1000 women aged between 50 to 59. And so, Normally, they say out of 1,000 women of that age group, there will be 23 cases of breast cancer. Um, if you were on combined hormone replacement therapy, they would expect an additional four cases of breast cancer. There would be four fewer cases if you were having estrogen only, which is extremely interesting, um, which of course not every woman can have estrogen only because if you have a womb, you have to have the progesterone. progesterone. Um, if you have the combined contraceptive pill, there'll be four extra cases, but nobody seems to worry about that so much. Um, if you drink two or more units of alcohol a day, there'll be five extra cases. Um, if you are a smoker, there'll be three extra ones. If you are overweight with a BMI greater than 30, there will be 24 extra cases. So that takes that up to 27 cases, um, four, sorry, 47 cases. Um, and if you do at least two hours or two and a half hours of moderate exercise a week, there will be seven fewer cases. So I guess if you were having estrogen and doing 10, uh, two and a half hours worth of exercise a week, um, you'd probably be in, in a reasonable shape. So the, I mean, I think the, the thing that's really useful about that sh chart is to just show how the lifestyle factors actually have a considerably larger effect than the um, than the, the the HRT itself. Yeah, and breast cancer is always top of people's list to worry about or a reason why they don't consider HRT. And it is really important to know that um, first of all, the, the the studies that have related a possible increased risk of breast cancer with HRT don't actually imply causation. So in other words, just because there were a few extra cases of breast cancer in those that took HRT doesn't mean that one caused the other. Um, but actually all of those studies where there was any association were about the old fashioned types of HRT. And there are plenty of cases where there is definitely no increased risk. So if you're under the age of 50 um, taking HRT, there's no increased risk of breast cancer. Um, and if you're using estrogen on its own because you've had a hysterectomy, there is no increased risk of breast cancer in case, in fact, the risk actually goes down 
a bit. And if you stick to body identical HRT, there is no study that shows an increase in the risk of breast cancer. So it's trying to reassure women that unfortunately breast cancer is very common for us women about between one in seven and one in eight of us we will get it at some point in our lives but most of our risk comes down to our lifestyle and the, the biggest things that we could do as women to um, mitigate that is to keep our weight down by eating well and exercising and trying to avoid too much alcohol um, that is where the big <laughs> wins come in Yep, lockdown's done been really good for those, haven't they? <laughs> Hasn't it? <laughs> so much extra exercise and so much less alcohol. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, now we're all in, the other thing that's important about this, isn't it? When it comes to, I mean, you mentioned before that we've, you know, we're now living 30, 40, perhaps even 50 years as menopausal women. How important is the HRT then to our long-term health? What does it do in terms of our bones, our brain, um, and our heart? Yeah, it does everything. Um, it's if we start with the sort of blood vessels it's really protective of our blood vessels so it helps with things like keeping our cholesterol um, down it helps with blood pressure control it helps with our metabolism of how, how we we process sugar through our body for example so um, it can very much protect our blood vessels from starting to form plaques and therefore that has a big knock-on effect on our risk of heart disease and strokes um, it's really good at helping us to remodel our bones better. So our bones are constantly undergoing, um, a, they're building up and they're breaking down in a, in a cycle. But if we can make the building up process greater than the breaking down, we're going to actually build bone. So it's really important for that. And osteoporosis always sounds like a little bit of a, uh, maybe a uh, something that most women don't think of at the sort of age that we're currently at because it seems a long way off. Um, you know, if, if most fractured hips occurs in, in women in their seventies and that seems a long way off, but actually we want to prevent that and it's far better done. We lose most of our bone density in the five years after our menopause. So if we can get in there and prevent it, that's really helpful. And our brains are, we have estrogen receptors everywhere in our body and the brain is no exception. And there would appear to be um, increasing amounts of research and data showing that the process whereby women develop dementia actually starts usually in our mid to late forties. It can take 20, 30 years to start to show itself but if again, prevention is better than cure. So if we can get some estrogen back in our brain before it's been um, devoid of estrogen for too long, that would seem to be a protective thing to do. We also know that um, replacing our estrogen helps to reduce our future risk of diabetes and arthritis. Um, and also uh, replacing estrogen helps to reduce obesity, which then has a big knock on effect on lots of other disease processes. And it will help to present, prevent all those bladder and, and vaginal problems, which are so common after the menopause. Yeah, that's true. And the um, a couple, a couple of interesting things out of there with the bones as well. You know, yes, thinking that our fractures are going to be, you know, 20, 30 years down the track. Um, but again, this is another one of those things that actually is a major reason why we end up in nursing homes and because we break our hips. And I think it was you and I who were discussing this before that I think it's up to, I think, 70% of people who have a hip replacement um, operation don't live beyond the first year after that hip replacement operation and that's that's a really frightening statistic so you just really do not want to be going there um so i mean i guess the important things about that apart from hrt is also that to keep doing weight bearing exercise yep yeah it's having plenty of calcium in your diet it's making sure that you have some vitamin d supplements because we don't get enough of that in our diet and um and to keep doing weight bearing exercise to keep alcohol and smoking to a minimum um, and try and keep our weight good but the the driving force the driving fuel is the estrogen that's sort of coordinating all of that yeah and i know we will um we will touch on this with, with juliet later on about you know how long you can and you can't stay on hrt but from that from that then i mean are we actually basically saying that if we're going to be alive for the next 30 or 40 years and we want to keep these things in good shape should we be you know sliding into our grave clutching our, our dermal patch um or do we have to stop taking it after a period of time 
no. uh, sorry, just uh, there's another question in the chat from Don. Um, I, I think just to say as well, Fiona, you mentioned um, you would be dedicating the last 15 minutes to to questions. So um, just to note that. But yeah, Don says uh, being three year postmenopausal, how would I know what dosages I would need for preventative measures? That sort of almost feeds into where we were going, actually. Yes. Yeah. Um, so it's measured mainly on symptom control and how you feel in yourself. Um, but there are um, options. It doesn't have to be done, but there are options to check things like um, blood levels. And although there are no hard and fast numbers that apply categorically to everyone, there is good ranges that apply to most women that we can be fairly sure that those levels are good. But uh, a, quite a lot of women will also choose to have bone density scans, which is the best way of checking your bone density. Yes, although not, I don't think people think about bones at all. I mean, I, you know, that menopause survey that I've got on my site, I literally, I know I keep saying this to you every time we talk, I honestly swear to you that I think probably now out of about the 400 women who've done it, literally only about three have mentioned bones as being an issue. Um, I just don't think it's on anybody's radar really. And understandably, because that's you know, it's a silent killer, I guess, really, isn't it? The- yeah, um, Until we trip over. No, exactly. And then you think, geez, that was, um, was not good. So I guess this sort of means in the end, do we have to start thinking differently about the way we, we think about um, HRT now? Because generally, you know, you were saying before that, you, that people are always saying, I want to tough it out. I, I feel like I'm giving in if I have to take it, um, that it, it, you know, I want to go the natural route, these sorts of things. Are we actually doing ourselves a disservice if we continue to think that way? Yeah, I think we are, we're doing ourselves a disservice if we don't arm ourselves with information and that we don't as, as, a, as a health um, nation also inform our, um, our population of women what the pros and cons are of, not, of doing something about your menopause. Um, and we also need to inform our nation of healthcare providers um, because if women know what they want but can't get what they want, that's not helpful either. It's really trying to, you know, I, like you, Fiona, I'm not advocating that HRT is absolutely perfect and should be taken by every woman on the planet because that's not the case. But every woman needs to know that she has that option and what the pros and cons of that for her are. So every woman really should have a plan of action and a consultation really in the lead up to the menopause just to get her um her options out on the table and what's pertinent to her what's the most important things to her what she is worried about um and and you know lifestyle really does need a lot of attention as well you know you could you could take perfect hrt but if you still lead an extremely unhealthy lifestyle you're going to undo a lot of the good so it's part of a bigger jigsaw. Really. Yeah, yeah. And I guess the other part about, you know, us being informed and, and then, you know, saying that this is what we want. I guess the other side of this is too, is that, you know, a lot of women have great difficulty getting their GP to agree with it. Um, how do we convince somebody that this should actually be a shared decision? Mm. Yeah, it's not easy. I think we're making some progress with, um, educating other healthcare professionals and you know people like yourself Fiona and, and and people on social media that are making you know we're empowering more and more women to have information and to actually not be fobbed off and to challenge if they feel that they're given an answer which isn't right for them so things like challenging if they're offered only antidepressants um challenging if they're told that they have to wait until they've actually finished their periods until anybody can do anything um challenging if they're told that all their waterwork symptoms can only be due to their age and having had children and and, and having the right information but also to um you know to try and be your own advocate and I think as sad as it seems but it's progress I think we have we have and we need to move away from this paternalistic 
sort of medicine that we've always had where a patient comes to doctor says what their symptoms are doctor decides what it is and doctor decides what to do about it that's that that is old-fashioned and not fit for purpose anymore the idea is that the patient comes with her ideas about what might be going on and, and what's important to her and then the doctor and her have a 50 50 discussion and sort of um and a, and a you know a, a, a sort of a bargaining discussion um and if the outcome still isn't favorable then that woman still has the right to ask for a second opinion from somebody else um yes and hopefully not be um be told as as um as i've heard been consulting dr google have we <laughs> to be fair that's you know it's there, there isn't a whole lot of other options and especially at the moment you know it's you can't blame women for trying to help themselves when when they're um, at yeah, their wits end yeah exactly they're at their wits end and actually a lot of women are trying to do what they consider the decent thing and take pressure off the nhs while the nhs is dealing with covid um but actually you know lives are at stake with the menopause as well and it's not just a um uh you know we've had plenty of messages from women that say that their gp there's a sign on their website saying we're not dealing with the menopause during the pandemic and you think that's well would you not deal with high blood pressure during the pandemic or diabetes uh, it's, yeah um it's it's no one has that right to to to, to say that um, no, because women actually do commit suicide during this period of time. Between the ages of 45 and 55 is the highest suicide rate for women, the highest divorce rate. And you know, there has to be something in common with the two. Um, we have actually quite a good question here from Maria uh, saying, hi, ladies, with all the benefits of HRT, do you think all women should be on it from their mid 40s? Should it be like statins in the water that they used to say? That's a good question. I think if I'm being very generic I think if that were done obviously that were completely and utterly unethical but if that were done actually the health of the nation and society in general would be better because of all the 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 disease that would be avoided and the um, society would actually be richer as a result because women would stay in their jobs there'd be less family um, breakdowns um, and there'd be a lot less people in care and needing social services. However, that would obviously be completely unethical. And HRT isn't absolutely perfect for everyone. We all have different genetic makeups and we all process hormones in different ways. And so, um, no, I don't advocate that, but I, every woman should have mm. the option of knowing about the safest type of HRT and she shouldn't have to fight to get that safest type of HRT. True, because you're right, there is an enormous economic flow on. We had that BMJ study out a while back that showed, I can't remember, we have the, out of the, the women doctors, I think uh, uh, you'll remember what percentage it was, but I think it might have been about two thirds said they had quite crippling um, menopause symptoms and a very large number of them had actually either scaled back in their job or had considered moving to do something entirely different which is awful and the other thing i suppose is the heart disease is um when you get to around about the age of 70 we you know we, we creep up there we're almost on a par with the with the rate of heart attacks that that men have so you know there are a lot of flow-on effects here huge flow-on effects yeah yeah the um, we had a couple of questions that came in earlier which i shall ask ask you now and they were um testosterone how do you know if you need that Good question. So testosterone is the kind of icing on the cake in inverting commas for many women. So for most women, most of their symptoms and future health benefits will come from HRT, which is estrogen replacement for all and progesterone alongside that if you still have your womb. But there are some symptoms which may improve a little bit or not that much with optimum HRT. And for those women, testosterone may also be helpful. So the main symptoms which testosterone benefits are um, low libido, um, brain fog, lack of sort of physical and mental stamina, um, and sort of, yeah, sort of muscular and, and joint strength. And mood also is, is quite um, uh, sensitive to testosterone. So if you are on optimum HRT and you still have sort of unresolved libido issues, lethargy, joint pains, 
lack of stamina, then a trial of testosterone is often a very good idea. And for women who have an early menopause, which we must talk about that, Fiona, um, testosterone is usually very helpful. And for those women that have their ovaries removed, testosterone is usually extremely important. And so just to go back on that, when we talked about the average age of the menopause being 51, um, that is quite true, but in order to have an average, it means you also have outliers. So um, one in a hundred women will actually experience their menopause before the age of 40, and one in a thousand women will experience it below the age of 30, and one in 10,000 will experience it below the age of 20. So that is small numbers, but you know, one in a hundred actually is, is, a, is a lot of women and it's, it's important for all women to be aware of their menopause and to tackle it. But for those younger women, it's even more crucial because the longer you are, you go without hormones, the greater the risks for the future. So it's not really, um, you know, uh, yes, obviously everybody has a choice, but really the, the choice has to be very much um, painted in a more, you know, why wouldn't you replace your hormones if they've stopped earlier and the earlier, the, the, the more strong that conversation has to be, the earlier it happens. Yeah, yeah, because it is actually, I've, I've interviewed two people recently who went through menopause in their teens and neither of them were offered HRT. No, and it's, I mean, that is just horrific because how, um, you know, they, they, they you know, to go through it at that age where you probably barely know what normal is supposed to be mm -hmm. anyway, and, and to, you know, uh, to, to, to be, you know, 18 or 19, um, and to have gone through a menopause, usually, and you've usually gone through it for maybe cancer treatment, which is bad enough as it is, and then to have problems with brain fog so that you can't even take your A-levels, or to have vaginal dryness, and you haven't even, you know, you haven't even you know maybe started on on your sexual life yet anyway I mean it's just it's horrific um and there is um a, a really good booklet which um Louise Newson has just written alongside um Ellie who is a um a very early menopause sufferer and it's a brilliant booklet for for younger people um tackling all those areas yeah because that really is it's just just some awful stories out there we have a question here from victoria i am 40 with poi post-surgery was recommended vaginal pessary with androgen and estrogen by a menopause specialist but unfortunately my gp was unable to prescribe it because the apc was refused the apc refused to add it to the formulary how can i how can this be addressed in the future i don't know what the apc is what's that is the area pre prescribing committee um and it's really difficult with these this sort of political wrangling that you get because it's very geographically random some areas are good some aren't good um and i think you know i mean it's 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 incomprehensible really that someone that has run out of hormones especially prematurely mm. All you're asking is is to have those replaced and to not have those replaced is completely, you know, it's just not, you know, makes absolutely no sense at all. And I think it's really difficult for women to challenge things like that. But I think it has to be very much, you know, writing letters to um, maybe starting with the, the senior partner or the practice manager at the GP surgery. And anything in writing is a lot taken a lot more seriously. Um, and so, you know, but but why, why can, you know, especially if it's been suggested by a, a, a menopause expert and then you're being told it's not being able to prescribe. I mean, that problem should be get roundable, but unfortunately the onus is on the patient to have to kind of fight her corner. So basically she's been foiled by a committee. Is that what, yeah. a, on a budgetary decision? Yes, almost, almost certainly. But it, it's what's difficult is that often GPs understandably don't have the confidence to prescribe what's been recommended by the specialist. And that's not the GP's fault. It's because no one ever, no one yet trains GPs what to do. But then really it's the responsibility of the person that suggested it in the first place to either start the prescribing mm -hmm. or to inform the GP and to help that process. 
um, because otherwise they haven't really helped the patient. There's no point advising this, that and the other if that this, that and the other isn't available. Um, so I would not settle for a no, um, but write letters to the practice manager and to the person that you originally got the advice from. Um, yes, and I would I'd be going further than that. If I got no joy out of that, I'd be going to my local MP. I think I'd be I'd yeah. be upping that one because that's an outrageous decision where where a group of people who don't even know you and your circumstances are making decisions about your health. That is um that makes my blood boil. Speaking it's of blood not boiling, expensive either. it's not like this is expensive, you know, treatment. It's it, it actually goes there was another question actually that I had earlier from somebody who said that um she she sent, she sent me a message just like the poor thing saying my GP told me when I wanted, um, you know, when she said that she would prescribe Sandrina for me, but um, the maximum amount that she would give me was one milligram because she told me that that was all I was allowed to have. And it was, it was sort of, I said, no, no, you can't have more than that. I mean, obviously there must be some budgetary decision or something, either poorly informed or a bad budgetary decision or whatever it was, but it was like, no, you go back there and you say, no, this is what the guidelines say. Um, yes, anyway, there you go. Moving on, there was one question here that was actually a good one as well. If you've, if you've recently started HRT um, and you're still having symptomatic fluctuations or things aren't settling properly, how do you, like, let's say you've got sore, what did she, uh, she asked about sore boobs, she was still having hot, um, hot flushes and sweats and things like that. Do you adjust the dose or does it settle over time? How do you manage those symptoms if they're not quite resolving? Yeah, so it's whenever we start HRT, it's always a bit of a, a can be a bumpy journey to start with. Sometimes it's very smooth and easy, um, but it can be a bit bumpy, especially if we're starting two hormones at once. We need them to sort of balance each other out. So we usually try and give three months initially just to see where things are at. And some women do say, well, oh, the first month was was not great second month is all right third month oh I'm fine now thank you very much so sometimes it's just a bit of time that's needed but essentially HRT involving estrogen and progesterone is a bit of a balancing act so if you think of a seesaw we're trying to get both ends of the seesaw about even and that can be very quickly done in some women but in some women they're all they they favor tilting one way up or the other so we have to try and overcome that which we can in time um so it's that's why it's really important and that's why the nice menopause guidelines say that everyone should have a review after three months of starting hrt and then three monthly until things are settled and stable then you can go to just a yearly follow-up so it may be um that if she still has symptoms of hot flushes, for example, that probably means that the estrogen dose isn't yet right and probably needs to go a bit higher. Um, and if the, the breasts are tender, that can be due to both of the hormones, believe it or not. It can be that the estrogen or the progesterone is a little bit um, uh, causing a bit of problem. So it's a bit of a juggling act, but it, it can be done. All right. Does anybody else have any other questions? And while you're thinking about them, I'll just ask another question that, that somebody was asking before as well. And that was about, um, I tried to answer it in my little video earlier this afternoon, so you can you can have a good laugh at my at my hormones running in a, in a wheel. But um, a lot of women, to, to find out, you know, they say, I've gone for months without having a period. I've gone nine months and all of a sudden, there it is. What's going on? Why does that happen? So, um, so why does that happen? Just when you think, oh yes, I'm coming to the end. It's a bit like, um, you know, the ovaries. Some of them, a bit like you described earlier, Fiona, work really, really well, really, really well, really, really well, and then one day just decide now we've had enough now and we're we're out of here, and so you have a very kind of short perimenopause, if at all. It's all just done and dusted some are the ovaries are kind of switching on and switching off for years on end and some literally it's a bit like they're going into hibernation when they get near the menopause they kind of go to sleep and you think eh, they're not coming they're not coming back they're not coming and then there'll just be this little last sort of burst of of activity and that's why it's very important to try and keep a note of your periods around that time so that you can measure have you yet gone a whole 12 months um, because that will inform how we start your HRT. So there's um, two main regimes for HRT. There's what we call cyclical, 
which is trying to replicate your monthly cycles. And we would normally start that if you haven't yet gone a whole year without periods. So we're actually trying to give you a bleed every month. And we usually do that for about a year before we progress you on to what we call the continuous combined regime, which is for people that have either gone a whole year without a period um, or that have already been on the cyclical regime for over a year. And the idea is that that doesn't give you any bleeds. But that's not to say that anybody starting HRT or anybody that's having an alteration in their HRT could bleed for the first three to six months. Um, but that usually goes away on its own. OK, Dawn is asking here, if you're postmenopausal, would you have um, would you have a bleed with HRT? It, yeah, it's so anybody that starts HRT can potentially bleed, but it might be, you know, absolutely, not, you know, it might be a bit of spotting on one day and, you know, completely done. It might feel like a period did. It could be a bit heavy for a little while. It's all, we all have such different sensitivities to the hormones, but we would always reassure and we would always warn someone that that could happen in the first three months, no matter who you are, you, you know, if you're, 50 or if you're you know 85 that could happen and the idea is to reassure and keep an eye on it and that's why a follow-up after three months is important and if it's still going on then we can either consider investigations but usually we can tweak the HRT to make it less likely to happen. And Jiminy is asking if um, if you have a bleed 14 months after your last period does this need to be investigated? Technically yes. Yeah, so if you've gone a whole 12 months and then you have a bleed, that's what we call a postmenopausal bleed. And although statistically that is very unlikely to represent anything sinister, it is best to have that checked. And that's usually done with a scan initially, which is a fairly simple and straightforward thing to have done. And only then if the lining of the womb looks a bit thicker than it should be, then you're often referred for another procedure just to check. But it's actually very unusual for that to represent anything wrong it's normally just that the ovaries have just decided to be really naughty and have a last little um you know burst um, <laughs> but it, yes it should be checked a final fling the um all right so we've got four minutes before we start with juliet are there any more questions do you all want to run away and, and grab a cup of tea um have a pee do whatever it is that you need to do within within the next four minutes and shall we leave let sarah go or do you have a final question or so to, uh, question or so to throw at her speaking to me speaking to me speaking to me i might just say if nobody's um got any questions the um the boss's book, the menopause, the Haynes menopause manual is a very good, you know, easy read. You can dip in and out different chapters. It's very good. It's brilliant. Good old Jane Lewis's My Menopause yeah. Vagina book is an absolute Excellent. must read. If you've got any genital or urinary symptoms, again, very easy, written by a non-healthcare professional. So it's very easy to read. It'll make you laugh. It'll make you cry. If you want a more detailed read, but a life-changing read, then Estrogen Matters um, goes through sort of all the research, but in a way that a non-healthcare professional can understand. So for anybody that wants um, some reading material, they're my three recommendations. Exactly. And going back to um, to the author of that book, I think um, the, he's basically, and um, he's the quote that everybody seems to be sort of putting around on, on instant media out of interviews that have been done with him is basically no man would put up with this and be you know being told it's just this is just the way it is for you go away put up with it stop whinging no man would put up with that and that came from the man who wrote that book so, and society um, wouldn't put up with it either we wouldn't you know we just let women leave their jobs and let their families fall apart and we just sort of you know roll our eyes and go oh well you know what do we expect there at that age and that is just no way you know that is no way to 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 carry on um you know if you take a, a man's testicles out or you um stop his testicles working he will not function properly he will not be able to work and he won't be able to get out of bed either and yet we just <laughs> women just are supposed to struggle on um but no more <laughs> no 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 more it makes no sense brilliant <laughs> my son i think my son is saying please don't take his testicles away um <laughs> <laughs> I've got a teaspoon 
<laughs> Brilliant. All right. Shall we leave it there? Give everybody. Um, oh, I think you've got about, about. You've got a couple of minutes now before we jump on with um, with Juliet. Thank you, Sarah. That was really lovely. Um, much appreciated for your time again. And um, I guess we'll see you very very soon. I see everyone. So I have to go. I have to cook for my children before they report me to social services. But. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Take care. Okay. And I'm just hoping that Juliet is actually here. Yes, I can see Juliet. Can you? Yes. I can't. Where are you, Juliet? Speak to me. Is she on another ah, page? There, there we go. Okay. I, All right. I will love you and leave you. Good luck, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So, Juliet, can you hear me? Where are you? Fiona, do you want to pause the recording and start another one? I do, actually. I shall do that. I shall start another one. It says it's recording. Hopefully that will save um, because we all know that I am technologically utterly, utterly illiterate. Um, so, brilliant. Juliet, where are you? I think she may have accidentally ejected herself. Oh, really? <laughs> um, How do we get her back? She'll be able to jump back in, won't she? Yeah, maybe if you want to send her the link again. Um, okay. Just... okay. Hang on. Oh, now I've ejected myself, have I? Where are we? No, no, you're fine. Oh. <laughs> okay. Why have I lost everybody? I've lost it. It's gone. I have, seriously. I've lost you all. Where'd she go? Where's my meeting gone? Hang on. Yes, she is saying send me the link again. Hang on. Uh, where is it? There we go. That should hopefully be done. She should be back in a second. And now I've just got to find the page again. Why have I lost you? Click the uh, F3 thing and go up to the top. It might have been another um, a separate desktop. Or maybe. If you, if you put it full screen. Got a Zoom login. There you are. Yep, got you. I'm glad you know what you're doing. One of us needs to. So, brilliant. All right. Hopefully, Juliet will pop back in. I think she popped in as me. Yeah. She's got my name now. She's got your name. That's very strange. Anyway. That's all right. As hey. long as, we... <laughs> as, long as I can here. see. Are you? Are you? <laughs> good, good. Apparently, you are my son. Ah, there you are. Yes, you are. Yep, you have, um, you have my son's name. There you go. Ah. I think it was my login, so that's, that's probably why. Anyway. That's, yep. fine. <laughs> That's all right, as long as we can see you. So everybody, this is the, although it says it has my son's name there of Alex Bodyshev, this is the lovely Juliet Balfour, who is a menopause doctor <laughs> at the Wells Clinic in um, Somerset, which is lovely. And you have been doing this for 30 years or so, which is quite some time. <laughs> That's like people can work out how old I am, which is a bit sad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we're all there with you, I think. Um, now, <laughs> you and I and everybody who is here tonight are talking about who can and can't have the HRT. So shall we start with that pretty much and whiz through and we'll have a little look at this. So there, there are so many reasons when people go to the GP that they're told that they can't have it. Um, so will we just quickly run through those and um, and yay or nay them as we go. One of the top ones is um, high blood pressure. Can you have HRT if you have high blood pressure? You can. Um, it, the important thing is to work out why you've got high blood pressure and, and manage it. Um, but I think as Sarah said, estrogen through the skin does not raise your blood pressure anymore um, and in fact can lower it. And I think it, it all came back from, from when, when you're on the combined pill, the synthetic estrogen on the combined pill can raise your blood pressure and that's why you've got a bit worried about 
people on the pill and blood pressure and it's sort of transferred to HRT but no transdermal estrogen through the skin is actually fine for people with high blood pressure and if they feel better and more motivated on HRT they're more likely to lose weight and eat more healthily and, and exercise more and actually bring their blood pressure down by, by lifestyle means as, as well as medication. That is good to know. Migraines, as you say here, or migraines, as we say down under, can you have HRT mm -hmm. if you have migraines? You can. And again, this is another left thing that people get confused with the combined pill, because if you have bad, mi I say migraine too, if you have oh, bad you? migraine, um, yeah, I do. Um, you're not meant to have the combined pill. Um, but um, migraines love changes and, and they often get worse in the perimenopause and menopause when the estrogen levels are changing all the time. And a lot of women get their first migraines or get much worse migraines around the time of the menopause. So HRT is actually good treatment for that. If you can level estrogen, um, give a nice steady dose of estrogen, a lot of women's migraines are improved and it is quite safe, again, as long as it's estrogen through the skin. Um, and, and that's we with migraine with aura as well, isn't it? Because this is the, this yes. is the aura yes. one is the one that they particularly pick up on. Absolutely. Migraine with aura, you cannot have the combined pill at all, but you certainly can. As long as you wouldn't give Eastern tablets to anybody with migraine, but you can certainly with the with the transdermal and that the patches are particularly good for migraine because they do produce such a steady dose. Um, gel can be good, but some people, if people are very sensitive to the slight fluctuations, you, daily fluctuations you get with the gel, um, then patches are the, are the best because they produce a lovely steady dose. And I always warn women that when they start HRT or if they change the dose, they might get a migraine just because it's a change in level, but then it should steady out and then hopefully the migraines will be a lot better. So yes, it's, it's a treatment for migraine, let alone a, not allowed to have it. Very good. Um, now, the other thing that people are often told as well is that they're too old or they're too young. Are there, are there mm. cutoff dates on either end of that spectrum? There aren't. So the, the too young is really important. And, and Sarah touched on the on the under 40s, which um, it is absolutely vital that they get diagnosed and get um, replacement estrogen for their long term health. Um, so that's a very, very important group. Um, and then the women with an early menopause, which is below 45. Again, it's very important that they they get HRT for their long term health. Um, but they're often they may be having regular pe periods, fairly regular periods. And that's where GPs get a bit confused and muddled and think oh you're having regular periods your symptoms can't be due to the menopause which we know is not true you can get awful lot of symptoms but still be having fairly regular periods um so and, and the great thing about with hrt is if you think gosh this all sounds perimenopausal you can give people a trial of hrt and if it if it helps if it knocks off all the symptoms you know you're on, on the right track um but i know it's it can be very difficult for women to, to get get their doctors to to give them HRT when, when they're younger and they're still having periods. So that's a, a good time to fill in one of these symptom checkers and, and so write down all the perimenopausal symptoms you're getting and show it to the doctor and, and hopefully make your case that, that you want a trial of HRT. Um, older women, so that older women is a really interesting one because we've got lots of women who were on HRT and were told to stop it. Mm. Some, some people say, oh, you can only be at home for be on HRT for five years, which is not true, or you have to stop HRT at the age of 60, and, and that's not true either. Um, and in fact, if you're on HRT, it's much better just to keep on going it with it rather than stopping and starting if possible. But if you have been told you can't have, you, you had to stop it and you're getting lots of symptoms, you want to go back on it, you can, um, but there is always the proviso that you need to have the estrogen through the skin. So menopause doctors are very keen on estrogen through the skin just because it takes away so many of the, the risk factors that, that uh, might mean that some people shouldn't have HRT. So estrogen through the skin is fine. Um, there used to be a worry that if you hadn't been on HRT um, and you were either over 60 or your last period was at least 10 years ago, there was a worry that you'd miss that what we call window of opportunity for the benefits of HRT. Um, the cardiovascular benefits particularly. Um, and then there was also worry that if you started HR, HRT too late, you might actually cause heart problems. If someone's already developed some um, sort of um, uh, inner elasticity of the blood vessels and developed some plaques in the blood vessels, there's a worry that starting HRT 
at an older age could precipitate a plaque causing a heart attack or stroke or something like that. But the studies show that that's not the case as long again as you have estrogen through the skin. It's getting boring, isn't it? I'm saying the same thing again. And again. Um, as long as you had estrogen through the skin. And with older ladies, we do start with a much lower dose and start very slowly and build up. Um, and it's always, we look at, everybody's an individual and we look at all their risk factors and see if they've got very high risk factors for heart disease. You know, you, you'll start a tiny dose and go very, very, very slowly, but it's it's not a complete no. Um, and you're still, whatever age you start HRT, you're going to get the help benefit for the bones uh, and if you're still getting symptoms you're going to get benef- the symptom benefit so um so it's the, the risk benefit changes as you get older and older and you know and then it's an individual decision but uh, and lots of people can can go on it at an older age and if you are older and you've been on it for a period of time do you have to start tapering off or can you just keep on taking if, if you're happy with what you were on do you just keep on going I think if you want to stay on it nowadays, as long as it's through the skin, um, you can. Yes, you can. I mean, a lot of women are saying they, they don't want, want to ever stop it because of the long term health benefits. Um, and you can go really quite low um, for the for the bone protection. You, you um, Very low doses of HRT will actually protect the bones as you get older. So um, you know, we'd often reduce the dose You know, if you, as you get into your late 60s, seven, early 70s. You don't need such a high dose, but it will still protect your bones. So you can carry on if you as long as your GP is happy to to give it to you and hopefully hopefully GPs will do more education and be more aware aware of this as, as time goes on why why don't we need as much as we get older I mean what what why would we I mean if, if we're sort of if we're happy on our two sachets a day or whatever why would or two pumps a day or whatever why would we um why would we taper off why well, don't why do we not you, need it uh, yeah hopefully it depends. Obviously, you've got your symptom control. So at some point, all those menopause symptoms w- would have naturally would have gone. Um, and so as you get older, you've probably gone through the symptom phase of the menopause. Um, so then you're just needing it for the long term protection. Um, and that and, and I say long term protect, bone protection uh, is just a very small amount. Um, it will, will, will help protect the bone. So there, there's, there's a thought about the, the very small risk of breast cancer carry on the longer you take HRT they are are there um there's debate about whether higher doses of uh estrogen make any difference to the breast cancer risk so I think the general feeling is that have to have as much as you need but there's no point having more but if you if you drop down and then you've got lots of symptoms back fine you you, you could go, go back to the dose that controls your symptoms so with everything it is it's very individual true deep vein thrombosis clots can you have HRT if you've had one of those Good question. Can, can you guess the answer? <laughs> Through the skin, estrogen. Yeah. So, yeah, so this is a big one and, and lots of doctors get very worried about this and lots of people have a family history, a close family history of somebody with a, a, a blood clot in the leg or blood clot in the lung and they have to take warfarin tablets for a long time. And if, if, if someone's got a close relative of that, we used to worry about HRT. And again, if someone has got a, a this various inherited blood clotting problems like factor five Leiden, and things like that um, and we used to think oh no you certainly can't have hrt and i'm guilty of telling patients you know 10 years ago no you can't ever have hrt you know because that was the feeling then but all the evidence now is very much that if you take eastern through the skin that does not increase your risk and if you have the body identical progesterone uh, butrogestrone again that has no increased risk compared to your background risk. So if someone's had a clot before, they've still got a, they've got a risk of having a, a clot again. And unfortunately, if someone's overweight, that increases their risk. There's various other things that increase risk, but adding, as long as it's the body identical HRT, doesn't increase the, the risk anymore. If someone's got a very complicated family history and an awful history of lots of blood clots, you know, the menopause specialist will probably talk to the haematologist as well and just check about it. Um, and quite a lot of people, with a worrying history actually on on a blood thinner anyway and then there's no worry because they wouldn't blood thinner but most women who've had a blood clot or have a, a problem yes can have hrt all righty um the other thing then diabetes can you have hrt if you have diabetes absolutely and and diabetes i mean it, it, diabetes is is type 2 diabetes we're talking about presumably is very much something that comes on as we get older 
Um, and in fact, the, the changes that the menopause can make us more prone to getting type two diabetes because we have these metabolic changes that make us all put on weight around the middle and reduce our metabolism and reduce our muscle mass. And, and putting on weight around the middle is a, a big risk factor for diabetes. So, so A, uh, HRT can reduce the risk of you developing type two diabetes and B, if you're on it, absolutely no, no uh, increased risk at all. Again, eating through skin, um, but, and, and it can help, you know, reduce your blood pressure and it's good for your cholesterol. So it can help with the other risk factors that with diabetes can make you more at risk of heart attacks and strokes and, and things like that. So absolutely fine. No, fine. Diabetes is not a problem. Kidney and liver problems. So there's, there's not that many completely absolute no's with HRT, but active liver disease is one of them. So if someone has got a, a serious liver disease with abnormal liver function tests on a blood test, um, they shouldn't have HRT. Um, Even if it's through the skin? Because I thought that through the skin. Uh, even, didn't... Yes, it, even if it's through the skin. Yeah, oh. even if it's for some reason. Yeah, yeah. Again, if someone was desperate, um, that that is one of the absolute contraindications. But if someone was desperate, you would probably write to the liver specialist and find out exactly what was going on and you know what the proposed treatments were. There's a lot of people with minor abnormal uh, liver function tests because they're overweight and they have this thing called a fatty liver. We get fat elsewhere, we get fat in our liver and we have my slightly abnormal liver function test. That's not a contraindication at all. And in fact, you know, as, H, as because HRT will help in other health ways, it, 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 it actually might be a good thing to be on HRT. Um, kidney disease, no, there's no particular worry about um, kidney disease and, and, and HRT at all. All right. Um, Dawn, I've noted your question there. Um, because, but I'll just get through this last one of um, reasons why you can and can't have HRT, cancer. So this is the other, I can't have it because I've got cancer. Does it depend okay, on the type? So it very much depends on the type. So the, the two, well, the, the, the two main, um, well, three, there's three Eastern dependent types of cancer. So some types of breast cancer, um, endometrial cancer. So that's cancer of the line of the womb. Um, and one type of ovarian cancer, it's called endometrioid ovarian cancer. So all the, most of the other, most ovarian cancers aren't actually hormone related. Um, so if, you, if you've got any of those cancers, you wouldn't be able to have HRT in active treatment. It certainly wouldn't be first line uh, with your symptoms. There's other things we can try first, which we talk about. If someone was struggling terribly and was desperate, then HRT would be discussion with your menopause specialist and your oncologist to decide whether the, the risk benefit ratio was, was right. But I, I wouldn't expect any GP to make that decision. It's a, it's a difficult, again, individual decision on that one. Right. Um, but there's lots of other cancers, people, gynae cancers that people get told they can't have HRT when they can. So cervical cancer isn't hormonal related, vaginal cancer isn't, vulval cancer isn't. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't preclude HRT at all. Um, and often, people with the treatment for those sort of cancers can um, damage your ovaries. So they often do need, need um, HRT replacement to help with their symptoms. Yeah. Uh, so, and there's lots of other things that people say, oh, malignant melanoma and all sorts of others, but no, there are, there's a lot of misinformation as usual about, about cancers and HRT. Very true. Um, Dawn, this is an interesting question from Dawn because they often you, you see an awful lot of thyroid problems these days. And I, I somewhere I saw a statistic that said that thyroid problems increase by about 20% in women over the age of 60 or something. So is there, can menopause actually have, can it trigger a thyroid problem? Not that we know of. It's very common at the same time. Um, absolutely. Um, and in fact, HRT can actually change how you absorb the if you are if you've got an underactive thyroid and you're on thyroid medication you sometimes have to adjust the medication when you're on hrt because that can interact a bit um but i mean if someone had a immune condition that gave them an earlier menopause and also gave them thyroid problems that that's connected but i don't think there's a direct relationship between between the two otherwise all right so it's just sort of an, an aging problem. coincidence uh, yeah and 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 sometimes the symptoms are very similar so Although you don't need blood tests to diagnose the menopause over the age of 45, we will often do check thyroid function um, just to make sure that it's not thyroid instead or as well of as well, um, because a lot of the, you know, the hair thinning and the putting on weight and the not, you know, and, and all those things are, are very similar to menopausal symptoms. So it's always something to think about. And if you've got a family history, it's also a lot of people have a family history uh, of thyroid problems. So it's, that's worth noting and, and getting checked out.
Yes, that's very true. Um, another misconception about these sorts of things is um, is you can't get pregnant when you're on HRT. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. that's a good one. So it is not a contraceptive um, unless you have the Mirena. Uh, did Sarah talk about the different types of uh, HRT, like the Mirena and the patch and things like that? No, we're getting to that with you next week. Uh, okay. That's your next, okay. your next area. But, okay, so, so, so yeah, so standard HRT through the skin and, and, and capsules and tablets are, are not, not um, contraception. So depending on people's circumstances, uh, it has to be considered as well. Um, and one of the options is the Raina, which we'll talk about. Um, it's particularly important with, with young women who have um, premature ovarian insufficiency, actually going on sequential HRT, so that's the type which is eaten all the time and, and, and just half the month on the progesterone, that can some, sometimes actually kickstart things a bit and, and increase your chance of pregnancy if that's what you wanted. So um, it's very important if you don't want to get pregnant um, and you're younger that you do do use contraception. So often it's, if, if you haven't got the Mirena, it's, it's sometimes obviously condoms or whatever, or some people add the mini PLN as well. It's really annoying, actually, because some of our progesterone contraceptives aren't licensed to be the progesterone part of HRT. So which and, and hopefully that will happen at some time, at some point. But then you could have your, an implant in oestrogen or, or or the mini pill could be your endometrial protection. But we don't know at the moment that whether, whether it would be enough to protect it. But so there's a bit of doubling up on the progesterone sometimes uh, yeah. with with. Mm. Now, I was going to bring my um, all of my little my little sachets and, and tubes and everything in, but I forgot them, so I don't have them. But shall we move on to the different types? Because there are, um, as I as I reach here for my my two page list, four yes. pages indeed of, of of things. There are a lot of choices out there. So so what will we start with estrogen first? Let's do estrogen. Yeah. Okay. So absolutely. So so estrogen is the thing that. Um, we need to make get rid of those horrible symptoms and it's what we need for our to, for the long-term protection on the, the heart and the bone and the brain um so eastern is that is is the, is the magic magic stuff um so uh, so yes but there are, so just briefly some you can have in tablet form um as uh, as i said you know we might you i usually start suggesting the the transdermal first and try all those a few people just love the convenience of taking a tablet so if they're low risk and they haven't got you know they're healthy haven't got any serious conditions they're not overweight they don't smoke etc etc and they really want a tablet fine you can have a tablet all right so you know they're not that so they're, they're, they're an option and then you can often take the tablet and it's got eastern progesterone in it so that that's that's an easy way of doing it but for most people we start off and, and try try that the, the estrogen so i have i have some bits here so um uh i've got some wrong. so easter gel that's that's a really common one that lots of people start off on um which is very easy it's it just comes in a you have a squidge and that's one measure um and you just pop pop that on you rub that on your inner thighs or your outer arms and just use that once a day the great thing about this is you can start with a low dose and then slowly build up without having to ask the doctor for a different different patch or whatever. Um, and and so that's an easy way of taking progesterone to start with. And I usually start with a really low dose and just slowly build up. Because and when you say you low dose, you use like one pump, one pump a day or two pumps or what? what, I, what is... Yeah, I usually again, yeah, it depends on the age, but I usually say try one pump for a few weeks. Because often, particularly women who haven't had estrogen for a while, they often get some side effects just to start with. And, um, and that can be a bit off-putting. So you often feel a bit nauseous. A lot of people get sore breasts just, just while they're, they're getting used to the, the, the estrogen again. Um, some people get sort of a bit bloated. Some people get slight headaches. People with migraine might get a migraine. So if you start really low, um, and then I, if everything's fine after a week or two, I tend to say go up to two measures. Uh, I think the instructions say start with two measures, um, but I don't want to put people, women off by having <laughs> you know, side effects and then stopping, which would be really sad. So um, I usually say um, the, the, the maximum standard dose for this is four measures a day, but you would, wouldn't go up. For, I would always say, we'll try two measures for three months and then see how you go and then maybe go up a measure because measure, you, do, you don't want to do it too quickly. And, and younger women who've had a really early menopause often need, need much higher doses than that. Yeah. Uh, if they've had a 
their ovaries out or if they've had a premature menopause. So that's one option, which is the if, gel. If you um with with that one as well, if you were doing four, I mean, this is, I I had that one for a little while, and what I found was I I didn't have enough surface area, even though I am a <laughs> relatively large woman. Um, I found that I was running out of surface area. So if you if you went to yeah. um to four pumps a day, could you sp can you split them two in the morning and two in the evening, or do you have to have them all in one go? You can. So you can put one measure on each bit. So one measure on one outer arm, one on this one, and one on each thigh. Um, it's designed to be once a day, but some women prefer to do morning and evening. Um, and it's absolutely fine, which some people find that it really um, gives them a bit of energy. So then if that was the case, you wouldn't be wanting to have some at night. You'd want to have it all in the morning. But it's really whatever whatever fits with your routine really um, um so yeah twice a week or twice and twice a day or once a day is fine um and it's, it's very 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 variable how people absorb it with all this hrt different things suit different people um and um a few people find that the gel just sits there you're meant to rub it in a bit and then let it dry but with some people it just takes ages and ages to dry um or it drips off and that's just their skin type and then we'll, then we try something else but it, it does suit lots of people mm. so that's that one mm -hmm. um and then that also comes in little tiny sachets which your lady last in the last talk was talking about only being allowed one sachet a day yeah on the <laughs> so um, i was like no so i'm using two you can definitely use more than one <laughs> So these come in two different strengths. This is these little sachets. So it's more concentrated. So if you are using a lot, um, it's easier to, um, it, you know, there's less so less less to absorb. And great for traveling as well. You know, putting mm. in your hand luggage as well. Really good. So I sometimes give my, if they like this, but I give them some of these just to use if they're going on holiday or, and hand luggage only because they're just so convenient. So that's Sandrina, and that's Easter gel. Um, and then there is a new kid on the block which is the spray. The Lenzetto. Um, the Lenzetto spray, um, which um, some, some GPs can prescribe, some they don't have it on their formulary at the moment. Um, but it, this is, again is good if people don't find they're absorbing the, the gel very well, because it's, it's a weird thing. And you just, you pop it on your, your arm and you just press it and it, uh, and it, and it releases a, a circle of, uh, of spray. And it's absorbed within about two minutes. It's re absorbed really fast. And you just, the, the, the dose is between one and three sprays. And you just go one spray, psh, and then the next bit of, psh, and then psh, down your arm. Um, and you don't have to, to wait around for a long time. So that that's another option. It's, it's a bit difficult. It's very variable how these two equate. I actually talked to the drug rep who makes these and they couldn't say that one measure of that is the same as one measure of that. It's, it's individual. Some people find it's a bit stronger. Some people don't. It's a bit variable. But that, that's an, another transdermal option. And then you've got, got the patches, which are good uh, as well. If people like patches, um, which you just put on below the waist. Um, and there's very, lots of different ones with various different sizes. So I'll just get one out. Ooh. Why does it have to go okay. below the waist? Um, I think. I suppose away away from the breasts, I imagine, is what, what why they do it. Or having said that, you put Easter gel here, which is quite close to the breast. But they've always said below the waist. Um, good question. I'll find out. <laughs> um, so you stick that somewhere below the waist and you change it twice a week. Um, as you probably noticed, there are seven days in the week. So do you change it every three and a half days? Tricky. No, basically it will last four days, but to make it easier, you just you know, choose two days of the week that you're going to change it over. So don't get too hung up on the fact that it's <laughs> the week hasn't isn't divided exactly. Um, and and some people lo love these. Um, you can still bath and shower and swim with with these on. Um, the very different ones. It, how how well they stick is variable. So some women they stick fine. Um, some women find that the glue on one brand irritates them, whereas the glue on an another brand doesn't. Um, so it's very much trial and error with those, but you just stick them on, um, change them twice a week. There is another one that's actually tiny, you can't, probably can't see there, but that's that's the oh, one I've got there, but that's an Easter dot, that, which is tiny. So some people like those because they're just tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, and with the patch, um, obviously the, the spray and the, the um, gel, that's estrogen only. With the patches, they ca can come as estrogen only or they can come as combined patches with the progesterone in it. But um, did Sarah talk about the, the progesterone types uh, at all? Not really, no, these are all yours. 
Um, okay, so <laughs> um, so from the point of view of, so I'll say the patches, you can have combined patches, you've got both the hormones in, or you can just have estrogen only patches. Uh, with the progesterone, um, that's an interesting one. So there's different types of progesterone. So the, the progesterone we tend to reckon, uh, recommend first line is the body identical progesterone, which is made from yams, which is the same as the, uh, the, the most estrogens that we use nowadays are made for yams, not the pregnant mare's urine that, of, of, that used to be that nobody really liked the idea of. Um, so the progesterones, um, Basically, the best one ideally is that the micronized progesterone so may to be the same as our own progesterone in our body, um, but that only comes in capsules. All right, that comes in. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't work in a cream. It's not. You can get natural progesterone cream um, from some private clinics, but it's not licensed and it doesn't work. It doesn't. It's not absorbed. So you have to. The only way to get the body identical progesterone. Is, is via a capsule. So some people like to take that. Um, it can make people a bit sleepy. So we say take it at night. Um, Which and is great for people who have insomnia. Would you take yeah, it like an yeah. hour or so before you before you jump in bed? Would you how how far yeah. before you went to bed would it would you want to? Well, we'd normally say just before bed because the one thing with this is that if you if you take it with food, you absorb more of it, and if you're going to get side effects, you'll get more side effects. So we usually say take it at least two hours after food. Um, so, so, and so, but just before bed is fine. Um, I've had a few patients who say, oh, we eat really late. So I've been having to go to bed really late because I'm having to wait for two hours before I can take my utrogestran. And so, so no, it, it's okay. If you're not getting side effects, it doesn't matter if you take it with food. It's only if it's giving you side effects that you, 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 you take it with, with food. And you can, if you're getting side effects, actually use it vaginally instead of taking it by mouth. The same tablet, you so, don't have to get a different pessary? The same, exactly, it's the same, same dose, same tablet. Um, so you don't have to order anything different. Uh, you don't have to tell your doctor you're doing that. It's it's not licensed in this country to take it vaginally, but it's it's completely accept, accepted. It's licensed to do that in France. It, it, it's considered very safe. It's actually absorbed, absorbed very well from the vagina. Um, so if you were getting side effects, so the side effects orally, well, progesterone is the PMT hormone. So classic PMT side effects, uh, moody, spotty, bloated. Um, so if you were getting those and they didn't settle quickly, and particularly if you're someone who always used to get PMT, you kind of think, oh, hang on, here we go. I recognize this feeling. If you're getting that, you can try it vaginally instead. And that often settles that down. But I'd always try it orally first because that's the way it's it's, it's designed to take take it. Um, and as if because progesterone is also the calming hormone, you can also it make can make you sleepy. And as you say, lots of women who are having terrible sleep problems with the menopause actually really like the like that uh, sedate sedating effect. Um, and so with the with the progesterone, if you take it all the time, you just have one capsule every night. If you're on the sequential, which Sarah talked about, so you're having it just half, half of the month, you take two capsules every night for half the month and then Eastern all the time and just two weeks on and off with the progesterone. So that's what most menopause specialists will reckon, reckon, recommend first line, um, but it doesn't suit everybody. Um, um, and so particularly if for some reason the gel didn't suit you or you, you, this didn't suit you, then you might try a combined patch. So one of these patches that's actually got estrogen and progesterone in. So I'm assuming the then in that, that patch is, is, the, is that the estrogen is body identical, but the patch about yes. their progesterone, it's a progestin, it's a synthetic progesterone, yeah? Absolutely, it's a synthetic. So, so the, the micronized progesterone capsules are the only body identical progesterone we've got at the moment. Um, but the, so the patches have a synthetic uh, progest progestogen in, um, but but some people find it better, and some people just like the convenience of just slapping a patch on and then just changing it twice a week. So you know, convenience has to go in, and personal preference has has to to go go in with it. And interestingly, actually, some people do get uh, annoying bleeding with the micronized progesterone. It's not. It's brilliant. It's because it's like a, um, our, our own progesterone, it mainly acts in the womb. It often has less side effects than some of the older progestogens, but it's not as good as cycle control. So some people might, might find that even if they're on a continuous regime and they're taking it every day and they've had their three to six months of settling down and hopefully the bleeding settles, sometimes the bleeding doesn't always settle because the progesterone just isn't 
um, isn't controlling you very well, you can increase the dose of progesterone and, and set it that way. Or some people prefer to then go to the patch and have the synthetic progesterone, um, but it does with, with a better cycle control. Um, and then the other brilliant option uh, for, um, I mean, there are other, there are other, are other, other progest synthetic progesterones in the pills. So some of the, the, the tablets have, again, body identical estrogen, but different synthetic progesterones, but there isn't progesterones, but there isn't a, an oral, oral estrogen with, with this one in it. <laughs> um, but the other um, option, good option is the Mirena. So we, um, so the Mirena, I did bring, I probably can't see this very well, but the Mirena is, can you see that at all? <laughs> yep, perfect. Um, I am sincerely hoping that it isn't actually that large since I've got one of those. But maybe um, that's, that's just a, well, it looks large like that because I'm holding it like that. But there's my little finger. Not that it's 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 too small. It's it's tiny. That's it. Yeah, it's it's small. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the Mirena is brilliant. So it's 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 so with it, it's basically like like a coil, um, but it's got this core of progesterone in it. And you pop it, pop it in the, pop it in the uterus, just like that. Easy. Um, can be a bit uncomfortable. Easy uh, thing to say, exactly. I will actually do. <laughs> yes, it probably isn't the most fun I've ever had having one of those inserted, but it, it is over quickly. And there was, I think, probably. I think it's important for people to know this. Probably a little bit of bloating for about a week to ten days. I had. I think some people can say that that can sort of last a little bit longer. So it can be a little bit uncomfortable for for a small period of time. But then when you think about the the other side of that, it's set and forget for five years, really, isn't it? Absolutely. So the great thing about the Moreno is is it's that the the, the the progesterone is designed to stop the lining of the womb building up. So it's it can be your progesterone part of HRT, and it's also a contraceptive. And if you're still perimenopausal and having periods, you don't have to go on the sequential HRT that gives you a bleed once a month for at least a year before you go on continuous HRT. You can have the Mirena and hopefully you will just have very light or, or less periods. So with the Mirena, it's variable. Um, I mean, it is a treatment also for, for women with heavy periods. You know, we do far less hysterectomies now because people can have Mirenas. Doesn't work for everybody, but some some people just get a very light regular bleed to start with. Some people don't get any bleeding at all. Some people do get annoying bleeding uh, and some be really annoying bleeding for up to six months. And then it often settles. Um, and uh, so you might have you know, six months of annoying bleeding and then four and a half years of no bleeding or very acceptable bleeding. Um, but it's very much yeah, seeing seeing what it's like and, and, and seeing if it suits you. But for the women it suits, it, it is fantastic. As you say, it's a bit of a forget. You just have to remember to have it changed every five years if you're using it as, as part of your HRT. Um, it can get a little bit of progesterone, can get in the cyst. It, well, it's progesterone, so it's a progesterone. So confusing. Progesterone is natural progesterone, uh, natural progesterone, and then progesterones are synthetic, and the whole group is a progest progestins. It's really confusing. It anyway, um, <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, a little bit of. The, the hormone can get into the circulation. So some people do, again, get slight PMT side effects, bloating, as you said, a bit spotty, a bit moody. And a few people notice that their mood stays down. And then, so we say, you know, we said try it for a few months, but we, we no one will make you keep it in if it doesn't suit you. Um, but it is a great thing to try. So we, yeah, it, it, it does sort of, the Mirena does fulfill a lot of options. So it's a good option if you're offered it quite difficult sometimes to get it fitted there's a lot of gps don't do them nowadays um the what well, the old family planning clinics don't do uh marinas if they're just for hrt they'll only do marinas if they're for contraception um so you might have to be waiting be, be on a waiting list to get one fitted for a while but it's worth trying if if, if you want one because you know they, they are they can be great mm -hmm. all right um then i guess we have um the testosterone then we've got the testosterone, which I haven't got a little tube to, to, to show you. Um, so as Sarah said, if if you're doing well on HRT, so either the estrogen and, and or your progesterone, um, um, and you're, you know, you're a lot better, maybe hot flushes and like you're on the right level to stop your hot flushes and night sweats if you're getting them. But if you're still feeling there's something missing, if your libido is still very low, 
um, if, you, if, if your cognition isn't still quite there, then after three to six months of a good dose of estrogen, we could consider adding in testosterone, certainly. And it's particularly important for them, it's vital for the, the younger women, the women under 40 or, or younger who, who have had possibly a surgical menopause, had their ovaries out or had some treatment and gone into early menopause, they really suffer if they don't have testosterone. Um, but it's a very misunderstood hormone. People, a lot of women and doctors and gynecologists don't realize that testosterone is a really important uh, hormone for, for women as well as men. Um, and, but we have a, if you don't have, if you don't have your, if you don't have your ovaries out, women often have a much slower reduction in testosterone than, than the estrogen. So um, it's not quite as dramatic. Uh, on the NHS, you should be able to get testosterone, um, but it can be difficult and it's only really licensed for low libido. But a lot of women, we need more studies, but a lot of women are finding it improves their concentration, their motivation, their muscles. It's good for muscles and bones, strength long-term, um, good for mood. Um, so it's certainly worth trying um, if you can get hold of it. Um, if we tend, to, again, with testosterone, the, the effect often takes quite a while to build up. Um, so often women don't actually notice much difference till they've been on it for about three months. If people, notice no difference after six months we would probably say okay it's you know that's not what you need and we we don't just go on and on with it yeah but a, a good try a trial for, for six months is certainly worth it for, for some people um a lot of gps aren't um haven't done any training in testosterone and would run a mile if you ask them for testosterone hopefully that will change um, um, but some and, and some GPs actually even who know a bit about it and want to prescribe it aren't actually allowed to prescribe it by their local uh, prescribing team. So it's a bit hit and miss around the country at the moment. That's just um, bizarre. I just can't understand how somebody else can come in and interfere with your prescription. The other thing I guess mm -hmm. is important about this is um, is vaginal um, estrogen. Mm. or vaginal atrophy and stress and incontinence and all those sorts Absolutely. of things. What are our Absolutely. options there? Lots of options. So up to 80% of us will get some symptoms down below eventually. Sometimes it's the first symptom of menopause. Sometimes you don't have problems till you're 60s or 70s. But once you get those symptoms, um, they're not going get, to get, go away without treatment. And that's really important. And, and, and a lot of women, I think something like 80% of people, women get those symptoms and only 8% are actually on treatment for it, which, which is horrific. And nobody talks about it. And it's, that's really got to change. No. Uh, so just, just actually for people who, who, who are new to this kind of thing, this is something that has afflicted me. And Alex, my son, you can shut your ears now if you don't want to hear this. Um, <laughs> It, it got to the point actually where it was difficult to sit, difficult to walk mm. because the external, um, you know, the labia, the, the skin on the outside of the vulva becomes so dry and thin and it tears and, and it becomes irritated and it, it, it could make your life unbelievably uncomfortable and the worst thing is if you're an idiot like me who thinks that you know everything you think it's repeated cases of thrush so you keep on going mm -hmm. back to your mm -hmm. chemist and buying huge amounts of caniston using mm -hmm. that and it gives you a relief for a little bit of time and then it's back again um, and I very stupidly did that for about two years until somebody actually just looked at me and said for god's sake darling you need some avestin and it was sort of mm -hmm. like oh mm -hmm. oh thank god revolutionary revolutionary changed my life absolutely absolutely so painful on the outside painful on the inside, too painful to have sex. And it's just the bladder is also affected with the lack of estrogen in the same way as the vagina and the vulva are. And the urethra, which is a little tube, which the urine comes out of the bladder. Um, and that all gets thin and sore and irritable. And you have to get up at night to wee. And when you're out shopping, you you sort of, uh, you, you have to check where the nearest loo is because you might have to rush to the loo. It can really ruin people's lives and really affect their day-to-day -day life. So one option is HRT as we talked about, um, because a lot of people will find if they go on HRT, that will improve their symptoms. But if you don't want to go on HRT yet, um, vaginal estrogen is, is another brilliant option or can be the only option if people just prefer to have, if I've got any other symptoms and want to stay just on vaginal, vaginal estrogen. So we don't count local vaginal estrogen as HRT because it doesn't go into the body. It's literally just absorbed locally where it's needed. Um, the only proviso that I do warn women with that is if their tissues are very thin, um, just um, and you're putting something in the vagina just for the first few weeks, a little bit of 
estrogen might go into the circulation. So people might get a bit of breast tenderness or headaches or a few little blip symptoms, but it's only a tiny amount and that will settle. As the vaginal walls thicken up, they won't absorb it at all and it will just stay where it is. So it's completely safe um, and just local. So yep, so you've got a vest, you've got creams, there's lots of different things. So there's cream, a vesting cream, that's one of the creams that comes with an applicator. Um, and that's so that that you pop a, a measure in the in the vagina and you can also rub that on the outside on the vulva as well. So that's a good option. Probably one of the commonest things that GPs will 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 if, will um, issue if they realise that your recurrent UTIs aren't recurrent UTIs and then your which actually um, Gemini is asking that here. She's going to say she's got three years of frequent cystitis, uh, constantly prescribed antibiotics. Her hair was breaking. Yeah. She felt dreadful and awful. Had to argue for HRT. But she's asking, can you use these vagina the vaginal estrogen with the Sandrina gel? Absolutely. Yes, you can use both. Absolutely. Because the, the, see, the local doses are so small and a lot of GPs don't realise that, but you can have your HRT at whatever dose you need and you can add in the, add in the vaginal estrogen. Um, and not that this is probably the commonest, um, which is called Vagifem, and you probably can't see, but there's a tiny little white tablet at the end, at the end there. Um, and you basically pop that in the vagina. You take it out of its wrapper. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. Um, pop that in the vagina and you release this tiny little tablet that sticks to the vaginal wall. Um, and it that, now actually comes with a reusable um, applicator, does. I believe, yeah? It does. So these, these, these are the, this is the Vagifem, which is the um, single-use applicator, which is good but environmentally pretty hopeless and makes it more expensive to the NHS. But there's a new one, new kid on the block called Vagirux. So instead of Vagifem, it's Vagirux. And that comes with one, one reusable applicator. Um, it's much cheaper for the NHS um, and it's much better for the environment. So you may find if you're on Vagifem already, you may find that your doctor at some point does an automatic switch to Vagirux. It's the same tablets, same in every other way. So it's a, it's a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, and then you just have to use, use the applicator um, lots of times. Or you just pop it in with your finger if you'd rather. I mean, the, the tablet is absolutely tiny, so you might mm. don't drop it. <laughs> but you can just pop it in with your finger as, as far as you can go. That's fine. Um, and actually, a lot of women benefit from a Vagifem a little tablet inside and the Vestin cream on the outside because they're actually different estrogens and you have two different sorts of uh, estrogen receptor in that area. And so some people find that using the both actually works really well. Um, yeah, I do that time. actually every so often. Yeah. I, the Vagifem actually irritates me, so I don't use it very often, but every so often I use it because it, it does actually make me feel like I've got like thrushy type symptoms every so often. So I use I use it every so often, but the Avestin is, is generally my go-to. But there's also a, um, a ring, isn't there? The, um, there is, yes, yes, a little ring, you know, it's small. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is my favourite thing that Fiona doesn't like at all. Um, is this, this. Look at the size of it. <laughs> not a little ring. So this, can you see how flexible it is? And there's my little finger. So it really is quite small. And look, you can squidge it right down. So this is called the E-string. And lots of GPs don't know about this, but it's fantastic. So if you're fed, fed up with fiddling around with little applicators and little tablets and, and creams and stuff, um, you can ask for the E-string. Um, sometimes I get people, if they're very sore, I suggest the other options first, so things aren't too sore when you're actually popping this in. But this is something that's designed just to, um, you put in yourself, you just pop, squidge it up, pop it in your vagina, push it up as far as you can. It'll just sit, at, sit near the top of your vagina and give you three months of local estrogen. So the only thing you've got to do is remember when you put it in um, and remember to take it out and pop a new one in uh, after three months. Um, so that suits lots of women. It doesn't suit everybody. Um, again, it's all individual choice, but that's a great way to, to get estrogen without, without faffing around. And some people find the creams a bit messy. Um, th I mean, there is the vesting cream. There's also um, a much bigger tube uh, of estrogen cream, which is less concentrated but some people prefer, because all these creams have different bases and different additives to them. And so some people might find that this burns, but the bigger tube of weaker stuff doesn't burn. You actually, with the, the weaker stuff, you actually use a larger amount. So you're getting the same amount of, amount of estrogen uh, yeah. per application, but it's, it's personal preference. There's also some other things now I haven't got um, uh, samples for, but there's, a, there's, one, there's one that looks like a suppository um which you just you pop in um and you don't need an applicator so some people like that 
Um, and then there's something else called intrarosa, which actually has something else in it that gets com com converted to testosterone and estrogen in the vagina, and that suits some people. That will probably be second line with the GP. They probably want to try the not just the plain estrogens first. Yeah. Um, and there's and there's another little clear gel that's a weak, weak, weaker one. So there's lots of different ones to try. So I think if, if something burns you or irritates you, I think the message is that there's lots of other things to try. Uh, and until you find something that get 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 um, that that's right. So so if I was seeing somebody with with um, awful vaginal atrophy, um, I would if they wanted HRT, I would give them HRT and give them some local estrogen to get things better. And then if they want HRT, they could after a while stop stop and see if they didn't whether they needed the vaginal estrogen or not. If they if someone's just on local estrogen and not HRT. They have got to stay on that forever because if they stop it, their symptoms will just come back. Um, so it's a long term treatment uh, for, yeah, for, for as long as you want to ride a bicycle or ride a horse or whatever. Um, you know, it, it's something that needs to be, be, be used long term because your symptoms will just come back if you don't. You might yeah. find you could just you have a small maintenance dose because so with all these most of these things, you kind of use it for two or three weeks every night to get things better. And then you have a sort of maintenance dose. And so, for instance, with the with the um, Badgifem, they say use it for two weeks every night and then just go down to twice a week. Now, in fact, a lot of women find that twice a week is not enough to keep things at bay. So, in fact, you're allowed, you can use this up to five times a week with, with no worries about absorbing too much or anything. But that's something um, that, that hasn't quite got into the G GP land yet. But five times a week is absolutely fine for the Badgifem. You're still getting a very small dose um so that that's okay victoria is asking she's had a vaginal polyp um and a total hysterectomy she's waiting for an appointment with her, her gynecologist but can she still use um localized vaginal uh, estrogen if she's had a polyp yes absolutely yeah yeah there's no almost everybody can use vaginal estrogen even if even if you've had breast cancer you can safely use vaginal estrogen because it's local and and patients who've had breast cancer are particularly because of their treatment uh they often are very dry down below and very sore um and it's really important they get 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 some local estrogen there's just one group of drugs that if if, if someone's on something called an aromatase inhibitor um, most people say you can't have local estrogen. Well, in fact, there's no point because it doesn't work if you're on this drug. But almost everybody, people, if you're on tamoxifen or if you've had treatment in the past, you're not on anything now, you can. It's quite safe to have local estrogen. There's no there's no contraindications to local estrogen, actually. So um, it's fine. And you don't need to have, even if you're using vagifin five times a week, you don't need any progesterone. So as Sarah probably said, if you're on estrogen, and you've got a womb, you need progesterone as well to, to keep the lining thin. But if you're just on local estrogen, you don't need a progesterone because the doses of estrogen are so small, they're not going to affect the lining of the womb. Okie dokie. Now, I guess we should move very quickly on to the um, alternative medical. If you don't, if you can't have HRT or you don't want to take HRT, there are other drugs, aren't there, that you can use for managing symptoms. So which what, which route would we be going down to um, if we had symptoms that we want to control but we didn't want to have HRT? Okay, I haven't got a clock, so I have no idea whether I've got two minutes or ten minutes, but <laughs> so how, how quick do you get? Five <laughs> minutes, oh my goodness. Okay, well, there's not much to say um, because, well, basically, if, if, you can't, if, you, if you can't have HRT for medical reasons, um, if the hot flushes and night sweats are awful, we do prescribe certain antidepressants. Not, and so obviously it's really important if, you, if you're depressed and anxious to the menopause, antidepressants don't work, but they can work for hot flushes and night sweats. So sometimes they are used for that and that's absolutely fine. Um, there are other drugs that are occasionally recommended. They've got awful side effects. There's something called clonidine, horrible side effects. There's drugs like gabapentin and progabalin, which we don't really want to use. So there, there, aren't, uh, there aren't brilliant other options uh, apart from the, the antidepressants, the SSRIs and the SSRIs, which, which do help some people. Um, alternative, alternative medication wise, there's a multi-million industry on take this supplement, take that. Um, and there's the things like black cohosh and red clover and things like that. The studies haven't really shown that they make the, much difference, I'm afraid. So don't spend loads of money, I think, on, on other stuff, really. And black cohosh in particular 
does cause problems to the liver. So no, we don't recommend try even trying black cohosh. Um, it, it, oh, it's because I thought actually with the black cohosh, I thought they thought that the, the liver damage was. Um, there was there was a period of time where people did have liver incidents mm. with it, but I thought mm. they then discovered actually that it wasn't necessarily the black cohosh. It was the fact that these were just badly produced tablets with lots of other nasty things in well, them. Well, that's, you see, that's the problem. We don't, with these things, we don't know what else, well, what else is yeah. in them, I think. So, um, so, um, and there's so many things, there's, you know, magnets and um, all sorts of weird and wonderful things that, um, but I think don't, 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 don't waste your money really. Um, but, um, but um, I think the best story I've heard with the magnet is actually somebody they said the only the only the only thing they found with the magnet was that every time they went to the supermarket the trolley stuck to their pants. <laughs> very good but I think you know we, we must very briefly just talk about lifestyle is so important as well so um uh you know with with things like hot flushes not having lots of coffee and tea and not having too much alcohol and getting enough sleep and relaxing and exercise and getting outside so there's a lot that people can do to help themselves if they, whether they're on HRT or not, we all we all need to at this stage of life sort of work out how to keep ourselves as healthy as possible. So lifestyle is incredibly important as well, um, and um, can certainly help. And CBT is 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 can be really good as well if you can't take HRT and you've got that brilliant. I recommend everybody that. Um, talk about sleep with Zoe. Uh, oh, that, that was really wonderful. good, wasn't it? Yes, I sent that out in the um, in the link that you guys all would have got today with all of the, um, that long list of links there. <laughs> Down there is, is one to the Instagram chat that we did with her and she, she does, um, she's a menopause doctor as well, but she runs a sleep clinic. And uh, one of the things that she was talking about in that, um, you know, going beyond just normal sleep hygiene of having, you know, a good time of waking and a good time of going to sleep and, and you know, layering clothing and all of these sorts of things, was cognitive behavioural um, therapy mm -hmm. specifically for um, insomnia, and um, yeah. but that actually I was going to ask you about cognitive behavioural therapy for vasomotor symptoms as well because they use that for that, don't mm -hmm. they? They do. In fact, I've got a, uh, there is a book. I've got a book. Ooh. <laughs> Here we are. So I've got a great book for self help for managing hot flushes with CBT. So in fact, I met Zoe at, on a on a two day two day course about CBT for for managing menopause symptoms. So um, if that certainly can help people as well because we all get into these sort of um, you know circles of think thoughts and thinking things are awful and things are going to get worse. And uh, you know CBT can work really well. But I think everybody should have CBT. I, think it's I do too. Actually, I think I, I think it should be taught in schools and um, because it is just such an important way of of thinking about just you know retraining the way you think about yeah. everything, yeah. especially. Yeah. Because when you get to when you do get to menopause, as we were, Sarah was talking about before, the you know the imposter syndrome that we all suffer from, the the loss of confidence, the paranoia, the catastrophizing. I mean, yeah, I don't know whether yeah. it's just me who's going through this, no, but no. And yeah, the rumination, I, I, rumination. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Seriously, you you can you can you can tear yourself apart very very mm -hmm. easily, much more than you did twenty years ago. So I think it's I think CBT is an absolutely fantastic thing. Are there mm -hmm. any questions for Juliet? Um, quickly before we jump to poor Sophie, who well not poor Sophie, but before we jump <laughs> to Sophie, does anybody want to um, ask a couple of questions? Race to the loo, do whatever is needed, or shall we um shall we have a little break for a couple of minutes? Come back to Sophie. Um, let me know. I think I, I think I've done my questions. Shall we take a little three or four minute break <laughs> and race to the loo and, and do whatever? Nothing else coming up? No. No, fantastic. Okay. All right. Brilliant. Thank you very, very much for that. And um, people can find you on the link that went through um, as well with every to the at the Wells Menopause Clinic. Yeah, Wells Menopause Clinic and on Instagram I'm at menopause health as well. Yes, brilliant. And you soon will be um, on my website as well. I was going to put you up today, but I ran out of time. Oh, oh lovely. OK, <laughs> nice to see you. Have a nice evening. <laughs> Thank you. You too. And I will stop Bye. this recording. Bye. Take care. <laughs> And there you go. So everybody, this is the very lovely Sophie Medlin, who is a dietitian at City Dietitians here in London. And um, there's nobody who knows anything, well, nobody who knows as much about um, food, conditions, gassy bowels, nasty poo, and all those sorts of things than you. 
what a way to introduce me. I know, I know you can always rely on me to be, um, to, to lower the tone. If the tone <laughs> needs to be lowered, I will be, I will, I'm your person there to do it. So I guess the question is that when we get to this stage in life, um, a lot of things happen to us. We feel tired, we just start putting on weight around the middle, um, we're, you know, things just don't, we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not functioning on all barrels. Do we need to look at the way we eat? Is, how much of a role does diet play in that? Do we have to change the way we eat? Well, certainly a lot of women find that lifestyle changes that include dietary changes and perhaps a reflection of the type of exercise and movement that we adopt makes a big difference to some of those menopause symptoms. And certainly we know that eating particularly uh, a lot of plant-based foods can be really helpful for our gut function. Mindful movement can be really helpful, important for gut function. So when all of these symptoms, when we first start getting these symptoms of things slowing down a little bit metabolically, all of that sort of stuff that happens to every woman, it's time to start listening and acting a little bit more and thinking about what you can do to you know, help your body along a little bit in those times where you recognize those signals. Women's bodies are incredible and they change so much of our life cycle. You know, men are very different for lots of different reasons, but you know, in general, particularly when working with men metabolically, once they get to about 30, they stay about that same rate until they're about 65. It's much the same. But us women, because of, you know, we start our periods, then our life is very different for a short period of time when we're very fertile, our fertility drops, then we come into, we might have babies and then our bodies change again. And then as we move into the menopause, we're, we're a constantly changing creature and that's incredible and fascinating. Um, but I think we need to learn to respond to that better and to listen to ourselves more. And so often we're so busy that that's very difficult. Did you, you mentioned the thing they called mindful movement. What do you mean by mindful movement? Yeah, so we're really trying to move away. It's a bit, so we might call it intuitive movement. So what I'm talking about there is thinking, oh, what have I got the energy to do today? So I know I need to move my body every day. What have I got the energy for right now in this moment? This is the time I've allocated to move my body. Am I going to do some yoga? Am I going to go for a walk? Have I got some energy to do some hit or do I want to go for a run? What does my body need from me today? And just taking a couple of minutes to think about what you actually need in that moment and what would serve you best. Because I think, you know, there will be days where you have good levels of energy and there will be days where you have much less energy. And when we push ourselves on those days where we have less energy, perhaps we had a really bad night's sleep and we feel rubbish, on those days, it's best just to listen to your body a little bit more and tune in. That intuitive voice inside you knows what's best for you. We just need to learn to tune into it a little bit more and try to not push ourselves so much um, when things are difficult and also to avoid allowing ourselves to rest too much when actually we may have a little bit of extra energy for various different things. Well, that's true. I've got to say, if I listened to my body most days, I probably wouldn't get out of bed these days. <laughs> but, um, and it, actually, you mentioned intuitive intuitive movement then. There, there's also a, quite a large movement at the moment as well for intuitive eating. Is yeah. that something? Because, you know, we, we see especially, you know, apparently there's recently data coming out that when you hit um, menopause, that a lot of the old eating problems you may have had when you were younger suddenly come back, which I fully understand actually, because you, you know all of a sudden the weight that you could you know shift quite quickly 10 years ago just does not move. So I guess that can force you into bad habits that you might have had before. Or we've got this sort of cycle of, of constantly sort of yo-yoing diets. Um, are, is there a better way of actually approaching this? Yeah, but it's a long and complex process that takes time. I think there's a misconception with intuitive eating that you could just read the book or listen to a podcast and suddenly start eating intuitively. And amazing if you could, but most women, particularly women who are coming through to menopausal age now, have been so indoctrinated by diet culture, by following you know, the Atkins diet, the South Beach diet, the Dukan diet, every diet under the sun by the time they get to a particular age. And then things are just really, it's really difficult to undo all of that learning. You know, lots of women will have been on Weight Watchers for the last 20 years. And <laughs> how do you unpick that and suddenly go, well, actually, I'm gonna learn to listen to my body. So that takes time and energy, and it will take maybe working with a healthcare professional to get you into a situation where actually you can wake up and think what does my body need today and decide that what your body needs is fruit and vegetables and nuts and whole grains which is what your body always needs our brain sometimes needs donuts and cakes and other things but our body doesn't ever need them but we have to work through a process of getting ourselves to the point where we recognize and can listen to the signals again and to respect what our body needs day to day um, and that yeah it takes a bit of time and effort and energy and, and you know dedication 
from from the person who wants to adopt it it's not for everybody um but certainly if we could get ourselves into a situation where we all just tuned in a bit more to what we what we need to eat on that day rather than taking external cues for everything what should and shouldn't i be eating what does this magazine this article say i should and shouldn't be eating today what does that celebrity say i should and shouldn't be eating if we could listen to ourselves a little bit more most of us would be in a much better position to make better choices for our own bodies on any given day and in any given moment yeah i spent a lot of time going in and out of menopause support group forums and things like that and um and this is so it's apart from social media and celebrities and fad diets being shoved in our face um when people are talking about oh my god i you know i can't i put on all of this weight and i feel awful and i feel dreadful instantly you get a thousand people jumping on going cut out the carbs yeah, cut keto, out the sugar <laughs> yeah yeah ke yeah keto 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 those kinds of things um is, you know, do we need to cut out whole swathes of food or is there a danger in doing that? Yeah, absolutely. No, so there's no need to cut out whole food groups and certainly any food groups you're cutting out. And we'll hopefully talk a bit more about dairy and bones later because that's so important for this particular cohort. But with uh, cutting out whole grains, for example, so if you cut out all carbohydrates, you're cutting out all whole grains. We know that a Mediterranean diet is the best possible way of eating and that sort of encompasses lots of ver various different whole grains. So a ketogenic diet is certainly not something, so very low carbohydrate diet is not something I would encourage as a dietitian. It's not something that anyone should be looking to adopt in the long run. It may work in the short term to lose a little bit of weight, but for most people, it will be associated with patterns of eating that are less favorable for long-term health and less good for our mental health and all sorts of different things. And we do need to be really conscious that those those cutting out food group diets are all part of the crash diet situation and always end up with usually more weight gain than you lost in the first place. Yeah, yep. Um, now, speaking of the, the things that are important for this age group, and I guess the um, you mentioned bones there and so brain and heart as well. Shall we start with bones? If we want to keep our bones healthy until we get older, what do we need in our diet for that? Great question. So bone, your bone health is largely dictated from when you are, we've got a, a window of, of our lives where we can get our bones as dense as possible. And that's actually up until the age of 30. So all of us are over that kind of peak now, unfortunately, so that we call at the age of about 30, our peak bone density. And so, we, uh, you know, I worry enormously about this trend towards plant-based diets now and plant-based milks and people come, like young women particularly coming off dairy because we are gonna see a, an absolute epidemic of osteoporosis in that age group as they come through to, to kind of middle age. Um, so yeah, we hopefully most people on this call will have had dairy up until the age of 30. And so their bones will be as strong as they could possibly be at that point. Every day after the age of 30, uh, even if you have extra calcium in your diet, it can't go into your bones in the same way. So you'll excrete it. But every day that you don't get enough calcium in your diet, it, a little bit will be taken away from your bones. And calcium is the thing in your bones that makes them dense, that makes them strong. So imagine every day that you don't eat enough dairy, you don't get enough plant-based calcium with extra fortification every single day, a little bit of calcium is taken away from your bones. And women who have had multiple pregnancies and children, their, their bones will have been leached by their children to grow their bones. And that's a normal cycle, it's a normal process. But ultimately those are the sorts of things that really lead on later in life to osteoporosis low body weight, lack of um, weight bearing exercise, also have a high, increased risk of osteoporosis later. There is certainly a genetic factor. So some people will naturally be higher risk, um, but those are the sorts of things that put us at higher risk of having osteoporosis and developing significant problems with that. Um, unfortunately, as much as we would love it to be the solution for various different ethical reasons, we do know that people who have plant milk as opposed to dairy milk do have higher bone fracture risk, so higher hip fracture risk, higher incidence of osteoporosis, even if they are replacing calcium milligram for milligram with plant-based alternatives. So there's something about the plant-based uh, calcium sources that just don't quite work in the same way for bone health, unfortunately. So if you are moving more towards plant-based milk, so you've heard that's a good idea, or you are you know, you're completely vegan, for example, please be super conscious of calcium and do consider supplementation with vitamin D. Um, vitamin D is the other super important thing for bone density. And of course, that's also less abundant on plant-based diets. And so many of us will be deficient from the last year. And, you know, we've not had holidays, we've not been away. 
chances are we've been in our houses a lot more than normal. So vitamin D deficiency will be absolutely rife over the next few years. So we all need to be conscious of that. And if, if there's anyone on here who's not supplementing, please do make sure you're supplementing with vitamin D at this time of year. All right, before I take you back to the calcium for a second, if we are supplementing our vitamin D, um, what particular type of vitamin D should we, should we be looking at and what type of dose should we be looking at? So you want to be taking the vitamin D3 and really you don't need as anywhere near as high a dose as you might be able to buy. So there's like super strength ones and all sorts of things going around at the moment. And there's been a lot of talk about COVID and vitamin D, which might make people think they need a lot more than they do. You can take a higher strength one just a couple of days a week, maybe three days a week if that works for you. I prefer to take a lower dose, so 10,000 units every day, just so I know I've ticked the box and it's actually in a multivitamin that I take anyway. So it depends on how it works best for you. There are mouth sprays now, you can buy patches. There's lots of different ways of taking it now if you're not very good at taking it, taking it um, in tablet form. So just bear in mind if there are if it's a higher dose, then you don't need to take it every single day if you're worried about taking too much. And we should all worry about taking too much. You know, there are yeah. risks with too much vitamin D. The, uh, I think it was a public health thing, I think they say 10 micrograms, oh, was it 10? Yeah, 10 micrograms a day or 400 international units right. is, the, is the, the sort of general dose that they would, um, would normally say. And when you say there, there are risks of taking too much, so, because I mean, I remember I had this conversation with you once before, actually, when I went into a health store shop and the, the guy sort of pulled off the shelf the this obviously is not vitamin D, it's my sunscreen, uh, but you know, it pulls it off the shelf and said, here, take this, this is, you know, like, um, unbelievable, it was like six times the daily recommended do dose, and, and he was saying, well, that's what I take every day. Is there a risk of having too much vitamin D, and if there is, what is it? Yeah, absolutely, so we, vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, which means that we do store it in the body. So water-soluble vitamins like vitamin C and B vitamins, we get rid of very quickly. We flush them out through our kidneys every day. We need high intake of them every day, but we also get rid of them every day. Vitamins like vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin A, we store in our bodies much more readily. And that means that we need to be careful of not having too much of them because they can build up. And whilst we're not 100% familiar with what the um, outcomes of very high dose vitamin D is every day, because we've not been very aware of vitamin D for a very long period of time. We do know that people who take high doses of vitamin D are at higher risk of things like calcification of different organs. So for example, we can get calcification of our arteries in our bodies, which can lead to things like strokes and heart attacks and that sort of thing. So because vitamin D attracts calcium and binds calcium, if you have too much of it, we can get a calcification of different organ systems and that's obviously very dangerous and we also see a higher cancer risk in some people who have been taking high dose vitamin d for a long period of time so really worth being conscious of that and to be clear we don't know you know the 10,000 units sorry the 400 units 10,000 milligrams that the government recommends that's that's a bit of a guess really we don't know for sure what's right for everybody and again we're still learning so much about vitamin d but ultimately we don't want to be massively exceed, exceeding that dose every day because we will store it and it does build up in our bodies. Now, going back to the plant-based diet then, I guess there's another, this is the interesting thing about the calcium um, is, if I were taking a plant-based diet, or even if I weren't, I would have, and I thought, well, I'm at risk of, I'm not eating enough calcium, I will reach for a supplement. Um, is there a risk with the calcium as well that if you're taking too much of it that you could actually be doing yourself harm? Yeah, potentially, again, so the calcification of organ systems is a risk with high dose calcium. If you are not taking any calcium, any animal calcium, so any dairy basically in your diet or fish with bones and that sort of thing, then you do need to think about taking a calcium supplement. We would absolutely recommend that. And calcium with vitamin D is the best one. There's osteocare, there's various different ones you can take. But just be conscious of taking mega doses of calcium. Again, there is a risk associated with that. And it's worth, if you can, paying for a bone scan to see your bone density or going to your doctor and saying that you're worried about your bone density because we can all get those sorts of scans done and figure out whether we do actually need a calcium supplement that your doctor can then look after and monitor for you. Yeah, yep. Yeah, that'd be an issue. I'm just imagining... Um what most doctors would say if you went in and said, I think I need a DEXA scan, I would imagine that many of them would say no. Um, but yes, which would be sad because we don't really know exactly what we've got. Um, other things that people say that are, are useful for them um, are things like magnesium, especially for things like restless legs and symptoms like that. Is that something that's a useful thing to take? Or can we get enough in our diet? Magnesium is quite abundant in our diets. Well, it certainly used to be. So we're in this funny situation now where potentially the, the 
the uh, quantity of minerals like magnesium and also iodine is a bit lower in our fruits and vegetables than it used to be and in the plant foods that we eat. Um, and that's because of over farming and things like that. And it is added in some places, but we're again, you know, nutrition is a very young science. And so we're always learning things. And actually we are finding that people who are supplementing with magnesium are sometimes getting better, better sleep quality, for example, are finding various different things are improved for them, better mental function and cognitive function. And you know, magnesium is very important for lots and lots of different functions in our bodies. So it's not surprising that if we're not getting enough of it, we do develop some of these symptoms. And potentially our modern lifestyle. So for example, if we're doing a lot of extra exercise or we're particularly stressed, those processes are expensive in magnesium. So we use more of it up. So it might, we may well be in a situation where we get less from our diet day to day and we use more of it. So supplementing with calcium may be a good idea and maybe something that people want to trial. Some magnesium supplements cause diarrhea and diarrhea causes magnesium deficiency. So you do need to be careful about the preparation that you're using because you can end up in, worse, in a worse situation. The ones that I usually recommend, you can try a blended magnesium supplement. So one with multiple magnesium salts and lots of my patients do find that does help them with sleep. And that's lovely. And that's a great thing that people can try. It's a very natural thing to try. We also know that uh, bathing in that magnesium salt, so we do get some transdermal absorption of magnesium. So uh, a magnesium salt bath before bed, if you're struggling with sleep, probably will help you. And that's you know obviously part of a really nice nighttime routine as well. So if sleeping where do you get these salts from? Because I thought that, you know somebody else was suggesting these, this as well. And I thought, well, I'm going to try that. And I went off to the chemist and I said, can I get magnesium salts for a bath or whatever it is? And they looked at me like I was clinically insane. Where so do you Epsom get them from? Epsom salts are, they've got lots of magnesium in them. So oh, it's okay. just those standard ones, yeah. Yeah, okay, good. Epsom salts, good eh? <laughs> the um, other things is what, vitamin K. Do we need vitamin that? K, very important for bone health along with magnesium, both very important for bone health. It's, and that's one of the reasons why dairy is such a great matrix of nutrients for bone health, because it contains vitamin K, vitamin D, vit calcium, all of the things that we need, magnesium, everything to, to solidify our bones. Vitamin K, again, abundant on, uh, uh, on diets where we do include animal protein, much less abundant on plant-based diets. So again, you know, this is where this risk factor increases significantly. So we do need to be thinking about that if you are reducing dairy or anything like that from your diet. Vitamin K is very important for bone health. And those, those good quality uh, bone health supplements will include vitamin D, vitamin K, and calcium and magnesium. So just keep your eye out for those if you are worried about bone health for any reason. Okie dokie. Things as well like, oh, so brain and heart. So, I mean, let's, let's tackle them uh, unless there is anything particularly disparate between the two of them. Can we put them in the same bundle, working on the logic that what's good for the heart I and mean, what's good for the brain is good for the heart, what's good for the heart is good for the brain? Yeah. You, know, you know which way I mean. <laughs> I think let's separate them out slightly because I think that the psychological symptoms of menopause are very important to, to acknowledge. And I'm sure you've talked about this through these talks, but uh, you know, lots of women report to me in my clinics that they, the first thing they thought was, you know, I'm going crazy. I can't remember things anymore. I'm so anxious all the time. And we've, you know, we're in a very interesting position in our in terms of our sort of evolution as women in particular, because uh, you know, let's say even 20 years ago, maybe even 10 years ago, uh, going through the menopause, probably, you know, most women will have had their children, children will have left home, and they will probably be in a slightly quieter period of their life. Whereas now, most women going through the menopause might be at the peak of their career, they may still have young children at home, they are likely to have elderly parents, and be actually in one of the most stressful periods of their life, and then having menopausal symptoms on top, often the early signals of which are that loss of short-term memory or reduction in short-term memory and the feeling that perhaps things are just slipping through your fingers and out of control. Nutrition and brain health are very closely linked. So there are lots of things from a nutritional perspective you can do to try and optimize brain function, try to reduce that kind of brain fog feeling and that kind of fuzzy feeling in the head uh, that can also help to improve sleep and things like that. So B vitamins are super essential for good brain function. And I'd always recommend B for brain. Yeah, good, yeah. <laughs> a really good quality um, B vitamin complex. So all of the B vitamins work harmoniously together for brain function. 
And B vitamins actually also not only support sort of short term firing of neurotransmitters and what's going on in the brain, but they also really help to reduce that some of the chemicals that can build up in the brain that lead to things like dementia. So ultimately, B vitamins are super, super important for brain health. They are freely available in animal products. But again, so many of us are moving away from having so many animal products in our diet. And so we do need to think about supplementation. If you do notice that mental function slipping slightly, take a B vitamin supplement, just take it for a few weeks, see if you think you feel any difference. They work very quickly and we get rid of them very rapidly from our body. So you don't need to worry about them building up even if you are taking higher doses, your body will take what you need. I recently did some work with one of the companies I consult for, and we found that actually the, the incidence of B vitamin deficiencies, various different B vitamin deficiencies, was really quite high, even in the healthy population, even in people who uh, are eating meat and have a varied diet. So perhaps, again, we are getting less than we think we, what we are or should be from our diet. So B vitamin is super, super important. Any, any particular B? I mean, are you saying all of them, but is it, is it a B12 or a 6 or a 3? or? Yeah, all of them are equally them? important. So I was doing some work today on B6 and thinking about what we need that for and just you know it's one of the ones that we often forget and gets left behind but ultimately all of them are equally important so please do take a b vitamin complex rather than individual b vitamins because otherwise you just can miss out on ones that are equally important <coughs> excuse me interesting story with omegas so with omega-3s we get the plant-based one which is ala which we need to convert into the other ones mm -hmm. and then we have epa which is really important for our heart health and then we have DHA, which is really important for our brain health. And in an ideal situation, our brain is made up, about 80% of the fat in our brain is made up from DHA. So the one we get from oily fish. But most people in the UK don't get anywhere near the required amount of, of DHA. So anywhere near the required amount of omega-3 every day in their diet that they need to optimize brain function. And what that can look like in terms of brain function is, is, a, is a bit like taking 25% of the bricks of your house out, so a quarter of the bricks of your house out, and replacing them with polystyrene. Structurally, it will look the same, but it's not as strong, it's not as robust, and it doesn't function as well under pressure. So if you're not getting enough omega-3 fatty acids from oily fish in your diet, please do supplement every single day. Give your brain a fighting chance of maintaining the best uh, structure it can possibly have in order to support all of the important functions that you need it for. Do Not we know if, 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 if you have sort of, I mean, can, can this be, can those polystyrene bricks be replaced with real ones if, if we do this? Or is it once, yeah. once damage is done, it's done? No, absolutely. So the lining of each of your cells, which is what we're essentially talking about here, particularly in your brain, are const is constantly being turned over and actually across your whole body, the lining of each of your cells is lined by a, a fatty layer, called a phospholipid bilayer. And the, the lipids that you take in your diet will dictate the nature of that, that layer, that coating of every single cell in your body. And so if you're having lots of uh, pot, like un unsaturated fats, monounsaturated fats, the majority of the fats in your diet are from olive oil and monounsaturated fats like avocado um, and that sort of thing, then generally those, uh, and oily fish obviously, that those lipid layers on each of the cells is in a very anti-inflammatory state. Whereas if our diet is predominantly uh, polyunsaturated fats, so things like vegetable, processed vegetable oils or saturated fats from uh, animal fats like um, you know, the fats on bacon and also butter and that sort of thing, Us, all of our cells are in a slightly more inflammatory state. So they're much more prone to inflammation. So ultimately we can replace those lipids, not necessarily immediately, but over a period of time by reducing saturated fats and increasing those uh, monounsaturated fats and omega-3 fatty acids, we see that shift quite quickly in cell lines and certainly in brain tissue. So for your short and long-term mental function, omega-3 is very, very important. The plant-based one, so again, if you are on a plant-based diet, just taking seeds and things like that, that ALA is not useful at all. We can't convert enough of it into the EPA and DHA, which are the ones that are important for our heart and our head. So we need to be taking an algae oil supplement always if we're on a plant-based diet, not relying on a plant-based omega-3 supplement. Well, see, that's an interesting one, is it? Because we, we will get to these, um, well, actually, let's just dive right into them now. Um, 
you know, as I was saying before, I and mean, when I'm in and out of all of these forums, one of the other things that people are constantly saying is, well, I'll be absolutely fine if I eat a phytoestrogen rich diet. I'll be absolutely fine if I add two tablespoons of flax seeds to my cereal every day. Um, what evidence is there then that, that any of these things could or should or would make a difference to your menopausal symptoms? So with phytoestrogens, there is interesting data, but it's, it's, it's not consistent. So for some women, it seems to make a difference and improve symptoms. But for a, a roughly the same number of women, if we look at the research as a whole, there's no change in symptoms. And uh, part of that is the frustration of menopause in general, because um, all different. as we know, everyone's completely different. You can't standardize someone's journey through menopause. Hormones shift day to day, hour to hour. There's very, it's very difficult to standardize the research. Also, phytoestrogens come from natural products. And so ultimately there's gonna be different levels in them all the time. And very often with these kinds of compounds that come from plants, when we take them out of their natural form and put them in a capsule, they just don't really behave in the way that we want them to. They don't quite do the same job when they haven't got all of their other nutritional friends in them with them as a whole food. And so we end up in a situation where we've got really poorly controlled research and some exciting data showing that some women really benefit, but it's really hard to say who's going to benefit at what point of their cycle and who isn't going to benefit and who might just be you know, putting off the inevitable of having to use HRT or whatever it is that they're trying to avoid, which might cause more distress and a feeling potentially a failure if they have to fall back on that. And you know, I'm personally, um, from a professional perspective, I think if you if HRT is the right route for you, it's the right route for you and it's much safer and better than perhaps people are, are scaremongered into believing it is. But ultimately, uh, if you want to try and do it the natural way, phytoestrogens may be something you want to try, but there's no guarantee they're going to work. Could they do you any harm? Are there any people that shouldn't necessarily have them, like the people who have a history of um, of estrogen receptive breast cancers? Yeah, certainly. So we do need to be careful with that cohort in particular, but then that would be flagged up with those individuals. So, you know, we can again get into a situation where we're perhaps um, scaremongering a little bit when we talk about these things too much. So your doctor will guide you if that's something that's important for you. Your oncologist will talk to you about that. And for most of us having a, you know, a diet that's rich in phytoestrogens will be good for us because they come from plants. And if we're eating more plants, not necessarily in complete replacement of any animal products before eating more plants, then great, we're in a good position. True. Speaking of animals, excuse my dog walking in and out behind Lovely us every so often. <laughs> exactly. At least she's not barking at the moment. That's a very good thing. Tryptophan, that's another interesting one. What do we think about that in terms of, of people say that it's, it could be good for depressive symptoms um, and other, you know, other brain type things? Is there any evidence for, for that and where would you find it? Yeah, absolutely. So tryptophan is an amino acid, so it's part of proteins. And tryptophan is used as a precursor for serotonin, so our happy hormone. And it's also a precursor for melatonin, so the hormone that helps us to sleep. And so when people aren't getting enough tryptophan in their diet, we can't produce enough serotonin, so there's happy hormones, and we can't produce enough melatonin, so our sleep hormones. So Take, there isn't great evidence that taking loads and loads of tryptophan is going to massively increase your production of serotonin or melatonin because it's just one little link in this huge long chemical pathway of what we need in order to produce those things. However, getting enough tryptophan in your diet basically means eating plenty of protein and largely plant, uh, largely animal protein sources, but lots of plant-based sources have got good levels of tryptophan in them too. Interestingly, chocolate is a great source of tryptophan and good. so is dairy. So that hot chocolate that your mum used to tell you to have before bed or whatever it was, plant milk, milk-based drinks, milk is a great source of tryptophan. Actually, some of those old wives tales that are, are, you know potentially will help melatonin, helping your melatonin to rise so that you go to sleep. So yeah, getting good protein in your diet is a key for, for having enough tryptophan. There isn't good data to suggest that taking it loads and loads of it in capsule form or powder form is going to make any difference compared to if you just make sure you're getting enough from your general day-to-day -day diet. Which I guess, again, if you're on a very plant-based diet, um, are, are your pulses and legumes going to give you enough um, protein? Well, for some people, yes, but for lots of people, no. And I think we need to recognise, again, we are all individuals and our bodies need different things at different levels at different times. Um, and, you know, if you are someone who knows that perhaps you 
are struggling with getting enough of those happy hormones going and you are feeling particularly low, it's a great opportunity to look at your diet and think about making sure that you're getting enough um, of those key proteins and key amino acids to make sure you're doing yourself as many favours as you can in terms of keeping things going. True. And um, you, you mentioned before hair loss, and here is a question about that. Um, would you rec what would you recommend? I can't even talk anymore. What would you recommend for hair health? Yeah. So one of the things I always say about hair health is that you need to remember that your body doesn't care about your hair. So your hair is your body's last priority. It doesn't care. It's not interested. And so unless you're looking after every bit of your wellness, your body's going to think well, hair is not important. Does that make sense? So essentially we need to be thinking about for hair health, we need really good sleep. We need to make sure our diet is fully adequate in all, nutrition, all nutrients, whether that's via supplementation and diet or diet alone. We need to just be really conscious of our diet. We need to be making sure that we are moving our bodies properly so that all everything's moving through our bodies effectively and all that kind of stuff. And we need to make sure that we are really thinking about our overall wellness, reducing stress, all of those kinds of things. So once all those things are in line, then if you're still struggling with hair loss, chances are there might be something else going on. So certainly for menopausal women, we can see a pattern towards more like male pattern hair loss as testosterone rises and estrogen falls. And the way to protect yourself from that or the way to work through that is to do all of the things we're talking about. So thinking about phytoestrogens, if it's safe for you to do so, thinking about doing the things that help to reduce testosterone a little bit, but also just generally looking after your body. And if it is something that's really distressing for you, then HRT can be really effective to restoring hair growth if it's male patterned hair loss associated with menopause. And when we're talking about that, I will just show you what we mean by male patterned hair loss. It's when we're sort of going here in these little temple areas there that, um, that I seem to be suffering from. Well, I've got, I've got polycystic ovarian syndrome and although I've only just turned 35, I've certainly got that to quite a big extent as well. So it is associated with any hormonal changes um, that move you more towards more of a, um, more testosterone essentially in the body. Yeah. Yeah. But it's an interesting one. It's a, yes, it could be quite confronting losing your hair. Yeah, totally. totally. Yeah. But you know, I guess there are worse things in life. Um, vitamin E, this is another interesting one because we're told that this is good for many, many things, but also too much can actually not be so good. So what is it good for and how much is the optimum level? So vitamin D is an antioxidant vitamin and it's a fat soluble vitamin. So it comes from things like um, avocado and olive oil and those nice healthy fats that we get from our diet. Um, it's really good for our skin. So keeping our skin subtle and uh, su su supple and <laughs> soft and not getting too dry. Um, and so when we find women who've been on very low fat diets for a long period of time, like if they've been on Weight Watchers, for example, for a long period of time, often vitamin D can be deficient and then skin is drier, less supple, feeling like um, perhaps quite low in energy. And so it's really great antioxidant, but perhaps again, not one you want to take on its own. So there's no good evidence that taking lots of vitamin D on its own is going to support you in any particular extra way as if you took it with plenty of other healthy fats in your diet or as an antioxidant supplement alongside other antioxidants. Yeah. Just let me go back to the hair for a second. So it normally been, um, most of the hair supplements contain biotin, don't they? That's the one that most yeah. people are sort of normally taking. Is there good evidence that biotin can actually make any difference to your hair if you, if you are going to get a supplement? If you were deficient in biotin, then yes taking biotin can restore hair, lost hair. If you're zinc deficient, then taking zinc can restore lost hair. But if you're not known to be deficient in any of those nutrients, then there's no convincing evidence that it's going to make any difference. But as I mentioned earlier on, you know, we do notice that lots more people are deficient in these things than they were previously. I'm always uh, discouraging people from taking nutrients in isolation because often we need actually, if we're deficient in one B vitamin, chances are we're deficient in others as well. So we could take loads of biotin, but not be getting enough vitamin B12, for example, which would then mean that we still experience some of these hair loss patterns because of all the things I talked about before. So just be conscious that, not, that try not to take things in isolation and consider that. We talked previously on Instagram, actually, didn't we, about Viviscal, which mm -hmm. is a hair loss supplement, which has got some reasonable evidence. And I didn't know, but you mentioned you can get them on prescriptions. You can have a prescription uh, strength of it and you can get one that you buy off the shelf. So that's called Viviscal. And, yeah, you know, yeah there are the two. The professional one is basically twice as strong as the other one. It's about twice the price. So if you wanted to take it, if you, if you do need to get good results on it, you probably have to buy twice as much as the one in the chemist. Um, yeah, to, to and it's reasonably expensive. So just bear that in mind. 
Yeah. The other thing too is um, minoxidil. That's the the spray that you get regain, mm, okay, um, yeah, yeah. and um, that does have some pretty good evidence for it. But if, you know, you've got to continuously use it. Um, and there are some people for whom that doesn't work. Actually, this is where you get really complicated um, because some people don't have the gene that allows for the for the enzyme that breaks it down to make it effective. So not re regain won't work for everybody, but it does work for for a reasonable number of people. And if you want to know whether or not you've got the gene, there is a gene test that you can take called trico test but that costs you about 400 quid so you might as well actually just buy the regain use it for six yeah. months and see whether it works or not because <laughs> yeah. it's a very very expensive test the other thing to actually tiredness that's an interesting one and um should we should we you know sugars and and spiking blood levels and things how can we help keep those under control yeah good question and you know that does sort of circle us back into the hair loss thing because sometimes it might be linked to insulin resistance as we get older and sugar is important to be conscious of if we are experiencing insulin resistance if you are experiencing insulin resistance you might start with a bit of hair loss but you might also notice you get more skin tags on your body darker circles around your neck or underarms and things like that that's a sign of insulin those are signs of insulin resistance um, and you might also notice that you have a pattern where once you start eating you find it really hard to stop eating so you sort of once you pop you can't stop type situation particularly with sugar and that's the same for everybody in lots of ways but if you have a bit of insulin resistance that might feel even more difficult you might feel that you really have very little self-control around sugar and carbohydrates that's because as our blood sugars go up, when we eat particularly refined sugars, our blood sugars go up and then they drop down again very quickly. And as we drop them down, our body sends all the signals to say, go and get more. You need more sugar, more fuel, more energy. So if we particularly if we have like biscuits are a good example because they're very high in carbohydrates and not a lot of pro there's no protein really in there. Blood sugars go up drop down you want another biscuit go up again drop down again more biscuit your body's just constantly telling you to have more and more and more through the day protein is a really great way of mediating that protein helps to the, the blood sugars to the blood sugars to be better managed and so your blood sugars will go up but they'll stay up a little bit longer and that fall will be much more gradual so you won't experience it so much and it won't be that it's kind of in 20 minutes later more in 20 minutes later more it'd be more like in an hour, hour and a half later, more. And that's kind of much more of a normal pattern. And so whenever I'm thinking about snacking or meals in general, particularly breakfast, I think can be really difficult. If we start with a really high carbohydrate breakfast, you're starting the day on a point where you're just thinking, okay, blood sugar's up, then down, 11 o'clock, you're hungry again, up, down, up, down all day. Whereas if you have a high protein breakfast, make sure you have some a good portion of protein at lunch and then a snack mid-afternoon that might include some vegetables or fruit and some protein. So for example, carrot sticks and hummus or apple and peanut butter, some cheese and crackers, something like that. You something there that keeps you going through the afternoon rather than you getting super hungry and ending up in that snack cycle where it's really difficult to get off the train sometimes. Yeah, that's true. And I suppose when you think of protein for breakfast, I mean, eggs enough or yeah? Yeah, great. Eggs would be perfect. Or you could have like um, a smoothie bowl with nut butter and lots of yogurt, for example. That sort of thing is great. Well, you know, we've all been kind of conditioned to have toast or big bowl of cereal at breakfast time. And actually, we're really starting the day off with a big portion of carbohydrate that particularly at the moment with lockdown, most of us are not going to be burning off. You know, we're not going to be using that most of the time. And protein is going to be helping to stabilize our blood sugars, keeping us fuller for longer and giving us much better quality nutrients that will be more useful to our body during the morning. Yeah, yep. The um, where was I going to go after that? I was going to actually ask you a question. Ah, this is the other thing too. Um, bowels, gassy bowels, everybody's favourite topic. As we get to, as you will find when you get older, or well, you may not. You might be lucky. Um, why do we fart more? Well, what happens is our digestion slows down as we get older, and that's completely normal. So you might notice that your mum and uh, uh, you know elderly parents are taking eating prunes every day because they're constantly trying to keep their bowels going. That's sort of a bit of a stereotype that we hear, isn't it? Um, and actually, it's because our bowels naturally slow down as we get older, the same as other bodily processes as well. And so the longer the poo is in our colon for our large bowel, the more fermentation from bacteria can occur. And your colon, your large bowel, which is the one that where the gas is generated, is actually about a meter and a half long. It's a big organ and when that's full of gas from fermentation you're going to feel bloated you're going to feel sluggish 
And you might notice that bloating feels really quite high up, even under your ribs, because your large bowel loops under your ribs like this and comes down again either side. So uh, you just food is spending longer in your colon. We also notice that as people get older in, in around middle ages, the time when our gut bacterial diversity reduces. And in the reduction of gut bacterial diversity, we notice that people generally experience more wind and more kind of IBS, irritable bowel syndrome type symptoms, even if for the rest of their lives, they've been fine. What we don't know is whether that's a natural part of the aging process or whether that happens, that lack of diversity and reduction in diversity in the colon happens because we generally eat, get into rhythms as we get older with the types of foods that we eat and we're less adventurous. We sort of get into patterns a little bit more stuck in our ways, perhaps with what we eat. So there's good potential for probiotics if you are noticing that that's problematic for you. But whenever we take a probiotic supplement, we also need to focus on increasing our plant diversity in our diets because all the different groups of bacteria eat different plants. And if we're not eating loads of different types of fruits and vegetables and nuts and whole grains, then we're still going to be starving off some of the ones that are probably going to control some of those symptoms for us. So if we're going to look for a, um, one moment, my dog is just eating something that it shouldn't be eating, but before <laughs> I move there to pick this out of the dog's mouth, um, if we're looking at a supplement for probiotics, uh, what sort of things should we be looking at? I mean, is it enough to have a yogurt in the morning with a lactobacillus or should we be looking at a broad range of things? Yeah, great question. So it kind of depends on which specific symptoms you're targeting. But I would say that um, most foods that you eat with probiotics in, including yogurts, are much less likely to make it to the colon alive in the numbers of, of bacteria that you really need to, to get to get any kind of benefit. So a capsule-based probiotic supplement is usually best, and you're usually best buying them online directly from the manufacturer. The reason I say that is because if you're getting them off the shelf, probiotics lose bacterial count every day from the day they leave the factory, but the manuf manufacturers are very careful to put the day the number of them in from the day they leave the factory. So you might be getting one that's got 90% of the bacteria are dead because you bought it from Holland and Barrett or off the shelf from Tesco's and it's been there for six months. So mm. you need to try and buy it directly from the manufacturer if you can, because that'll give you the best chance of having a really fresh one. Simprove is a great brand. It's more of the expensive one. Biocult is a really great brand. It's a more reasonably priced one. Alpha Sim the Simprove is a drink, isn't it? Not a, um, not a tablet, yeah? yeah? Yeah, Simprove is a drink and they've done some really good work in wrapping up the colonies of bacteria in a special protein matrix to make sure they get to your colon alive. So Simprove then could potentially have good benefits for the oral microbiome and potentially the upper respiratory tract microbiome because it's liquid, whereas the capsule ones will only impact the colonic microbiome, but they're perhaps a little bit more likely to get there alive in the numbers that we'd be looking for. And the other thing about micro about probiotics, isn't it? You know, we, we're told, you know, when we look at your cult ads and those sorts of things, that basically we need to take one of these for every day for the rest of our life. But it's not necessarily that way. So you just what you just need to replenish and and move on. Yeah, absolutely. So if you take the the trouble is, it's again a newish science, so we don't know, know everything that we will learn in the next ten years. But in general, if you take a probiotic for three months and you're not getting a huge amount of benefit, chances are that wasn't the right one for you. So try a different brand for three months. But again, so important to make sure that you take all the good plant diversity with that. Otherwise, the bacteria can get to your colon, but there's nothing for them to eat when they get there. So they're not going to they're not going to multiply. They're not going to take over and colonize the bowel wall, which is what we want them to do. So, um, yeah, you could try Simprove for three months if you feel like you've had the benefit. There's no need to continue to take it. You could take any of the other ones for three months. There's no need to continue if you feel like you've had the benefit. But if after three months you're not really sure if it's made any difference, you could try a different brand with, diff with a different bre bre blend of probiotics and chances are you might notice a difference. Okie dokie. Now, the other thing that I was going to ask you about then was supplements specifically for menopause symptoms that people say work because i mean juliet mentioned the black cohosh before and she's not a great fan of that but what do we know about these ones that people specifically say are going to help with your vasomotor um, symptoms or your tiredness and, and those kinds mm. of things um because there are a lot of them let's start with black cohosh then so black cohosh again we're talking about a plant so it's the the kind of 
uh, standardization of the protocols in the research is really uh, diff is, is not great and so we can't pull the data very effectively in the same because of every woman is so different we can't pull that data very effectively either so for some women some of the time those vasomotor symptoms those those symptoms that affect hot flushes temperature control and sometimes even sleep and restlessness for some women black cohosh can be really effective not for everybody <laughs> And I think that's frustrating and difficult for people, but, you know, it's, it's not an expensive product. It's not something that can be particularly harmful. So if you want to give something a try, it's worth it. One of the things that we recognize in the menopausal population and also in, in lots of other cohorts as well, including irritable bowel syndrome, is that the placebo effect is really strong. So if you so and that's part of the reason so say for example your neighbor or your or your aunt or someone said you'll try this it's worked really well for me even if you just believe it's going to work it can be really effective and to me that's great if it's working then perfect it doesn't matter how perhaps it's part of the cbt which i caught the end of you talking about with the previous speaker because actually if we get something like a hot flush and we start thinking, oh my goodness, this is going to get terrible and terrible. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. It's going to be awful. And we panic. It does get worse and worse and ter more and more terrible. Whereas if we've taken something that we believe is going to work, then it takes the edge off it, it and things get better. And we actually don't go through that whole panic cycle that escalates those symptoms and makes them much, much worse. So for some women, black cohosh is very, very effective. And if you want to give it a try, there's no reason not to. Um, but if it's not working after a couple of months, it's probably not going to work for you. And there are other things you can try. Such as red clover. That's another one. Yeah. What do yeah. you think of that? Um, so I don't know much of the data, but it's usually pretty similar across the board with menopausal symptoms. Works for some women, works less well for other women. We don't really know why. Bee pollen and propolis is another one that can be really effective for some women. So really worth just cycling through a few of these things, but try to stick at them for a couple of months and give them a chance rather than kind of saying after a week it's not working. So you cut it out because ultimately that's is most of these uh, treatments will have a, a build up effect. And if we try things for a week and they're not working, we just give up. Nothing is very unlikely that anything will work. That's true. Agnes Castos, that's another one that people say is, um, is very good. They say often for, for mood as well. Uh, I think they used to use it for, um, for PMS and I think that they found that in menopausal women that for some women it can, um, can help with, with the mood. There was yeah. a woman today actually saying that she, she took it and, um, and had great results with that. So maybe that's yeah. something that people with mood symptoms or might think about. Maca, that's another one that everybody says is, is saving their lives these days. Do we know much <laughs> about that one? So matcha has some good properties in terms of antioxidants and antioxidants are really important for protecting long-term heart health and everything else. I personally hate it, which is a semi-controversial opinion, but if you enjoy it and you find it like something that you want to include in your diet, then great, or you want to try the capsules, then great. But ultimately it's just any like any other antioxidant and vitamin. So there's no like, magic benefits to it in particular for menopausal women, but some women may find it effective. Do you hate it because you hate the taste of it or you hate it because... Oh, no, I hate the taste reasons. of it, not because of the research. <laughs> I don't care about the research so much. Um, with the ashwagandha is one that's becoming increasingly popular and there's some really great data for ashwagandha root in particular and uh, menopause, not menopause symptoms, anxiety associated with the menopause. It also can boost testosterone production slightly. So if you are a woman who's struggling with sex drive or is struggling with dry, vaginal dryness and that sort of thing, then actually ashwagandha may have a double benefit there. But of course, if you are struggling with hair loss and things like that, you may want to avoid that because of the testosterone boosting properties. But could be super effective for some women. And if it is anxiety that you're really suffering with, then ultimately ashwagandha may be something that's of benefit to you. Good, and I'm glad that you said it because I never know how to pronounce that word. It's Ashwagandha. Way too, Ashwagandha. There's way too many syllables in it for me. Um, <laughs> the now I've actually forgotten what the other one that I was going to come to. What came after after Ashwagandha? Evening primrose. That's the other one that people are, are saying that it gives them quite a lot of relief. Do we know much about that one? Yeah, so it's got a high dose of vitamin E in it, which is, again, your antioxidant vitamins and things like that. Um, there is some stuff around evening primrose oil and it interacting with some other medication. So important just to check with your doctor or pharmacist before you start taking that one. I can't remember what it is that it interacts with, possibly statins, which is a really common thing that people might be taking. 
So just be conscious of that before you start taking that sort of thing. If you are, well, with any, with any supplements in any case, particularly sort of these herbal supplements, if you are on any prescription medications, please check with your doctor before you start taking them because a lot of them can interact. Yeah, yep. Um, is there anything else? Are there any other, does anybody have any questions there about other ones that they might have liked to try or, or have um, tried and think are amazing or things that have done nothing for them either way? I'm just looking through here on my list of things that we, oh, I know the other thing that we have, a lot of iron and, and, um, and folic acid. Is that something as well that we need to be thinking about? Yeah, for sure. So typically as women move through the menopause, unless you're having kind of cycles of very heavy bleeding, in theory, iron stores should be a little bit better following the menopause and as we go through the menopause. So in theory, that should be a little bit better. But iron, low iron, so anemia, does cause all kinds of different horrible symptoms, including breathlessness and exhaustion and all these sorts of things, and also lack of sleep. Um, and it can be useful to take, there's a liquid iron supplement called Spartone, which doesn't have any digestive problems. It's very natural and it just comes in a sachet with some vitamin C. It might be worth people considering that if they are noticing that they're struggling with their energy levels. I live in London and I noticed the, I think it's called Floridex adverts out all the time for tiredness. And there's, there's not very much in there at all that's going to make any difference. But again, you know, people believe, take it and believe it's going to work, which can be helpful from a placebo perspective. But Spartone would be a much better choice or a really good quality multivitamin would cover you for iron and folic acid as well. True. And um, actually, you mentioned their vitamin C with the iron. And is that because um, I think this is a, there are various foods that people always say, like, you know, take huge amounts of spinach because it's full of iron. Um, do we actually have to be relatively careful about which ones we're picking because they're not always bioavailable iron? And does the vitamin C, is the vitamin C important because it helps us digest it? Yeah, absolutely. So vitamin C helps us to absorb plant based iron. So non heme iron, we call it. So it's not coming from blood, so it's not coming from animal sources. Vitamin C really helps us to absorb that. So, for example, breakfast cereal and a glass of orange juice really helps you to absorb the iron in breakfast cereal. Um, with spinach, it's the calcium that's bound in spinach, but also iron to a certain extent is bound to other compounds in the plant. That means our body can't absorb it. So we could eat as much as we want to and still we can't access all of it. So we just have to be conscious of that and make sure that we have abundant plant-based iron sources if we are on a plant-based diet yeah and where where else would we find it then so spinach is a great source lentils are a great source of iron for plant-based people but um any animal products particularly red meat is a great source of iron for everybody yeah brilliant all right i don't think i've got any more questions for you is there anything else that you oh wait, actually there's one i think b-o-r-o-n i'm pronouncing that, that is it boron, boron. Yeah. 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 Yes. This is another thing that I, I I'd never even heard of it until today. So I thought I will put that on my list. It was another one that they were saying that was good for um, for menopause. I don't even know what it is. What is it? So boron is a trace element, like what other ones? So like zinc and selenium and things like that. So it's a trace element. So a bit like a vitamin, but not quite in the vitamin classes as in still equally important just as slightly different jobs. We, we use it alongside copper and other things like that. Again, for most people, most of the time will be abundantly available in the diet. We don't need to worry too much about it, but certainly deficiency in boron can drive some symptoms that would mimic the menopause. So again, if you are conscious that perhaps your diet isn't as good as it could be, uh, and all of our diets aren't as good as they could be, I've had fish and chips for my tea, um, I would say then thinking about a good quality A to Z multivitamin every day. It's like an insurance policy. So uh, well women, well, I shouldn't say these sorts of things. So, so there's real quality, there's real variation in quality of vitamins. So Centrum is a great brand, Sinatogen is a great brand. So just keep an eye out for those ones in particular. Um, the bioavailability of the nutrients that the companies put in is really important. Fish oil is really, really important. These things are like an insurance policy. So you know that your body can pick out what it needs and get rid of what it doesn't need, especially on those days when you are busy and tired and relying on convenience foods over, you know, cooking yourself a healthy meal from scratch. True. I mean, you can't be a saint every day. You're allowed to have fish and chips every so often. Otherwise, hey. your life would be really, really, really boring. I mean, yeah. I, had, I had hot cross buns for lunch. So, um, you That's know. So nice. <laughs> yes, <laughs> they were good. Um, yeah, you can't be a saint every day. The, um, and that's actually leading me to another thing because when, you know, when we do walk down the supermarket aisle and we see these rows of things, um, and you were mentioning before that we don't necessarily always know what's in them, is there, I think there's a, there's a sign now, isn't there, a, 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 a traditional herbal 
registration or something like that that we should be looking for on supplements um, that says that it is actually you know it does contain what it says on the pack yeah absolutely there are third party bodies that companies send their supplements to to check that to, to prove that they have got in them what they say are in them and i design supplements as part of my consultancy work and the, the process is that we as a company might say we want to put this this and this in it and then we take it to the manufacturer and the manufacturer says yes we've done that and actually what is really helpful is to get that third party to say yes the manufacturer has ticked that box they have actually put in what they've said they've put in and so the this person who's designing the vitamins or the product wants one thing they then take it to a producer who then says yes we've done that but then if you get the third person who's a uh, external person who's not financially invested to say yes that does contain what it promises to contain then you're in safe hands there with that product that's true and actually this is really important for cbd oil as well isn't it because this is one of, i was in a chat room yesterday with a woman who's basically saying she she uses it sublingually she bathes her body including her external genitalia in it she's mm. using it in, in you know vaginally this woman is living and breathing in cbd oil um of course she didn't disclose to anybody particularly until the end of the conversation that she was actually selling it as well um yes. of course um but you, this is another area that's really taken off do we know how much evidence there is for cbd oil and again that you know what's to say that there is actually even any cbd oil in the product that you're buying yeah, so again, because of the massive variation in the product itself, so because there's no real regulation of the market yet, it's still very early in terms of our understanding and production of it and everything else. There's so many different strains, we don't really know what we're aiming for. It's a bit of a shot in the dark with CBD oil. One of the things I would say is that in terms of mindfulness, having a couple of drops of CBD oil in your mouth and taking some deep breaths and just taking a minute to... to believe something's going to work and to refocus yourself a little bit probably will make a difference even if the chemicals in the CBD or the natural comp chemicals in the CBD are making no difference at all. And so we can think about using this, but like using aromatherapy or anything else, the moment where you just take some time to take some deep breaths and have a have faith that something's going to make a difference to, the, to you in that moment. We're in a good space there and that can make a really big difference to the direction of how we're feeling in terms of stress, anxiety and all of that kind of stuff. Brilliant. All right. I think I'm done. I don't think I yes. have anything more to say. <laughs> Thank God, she says. <laughs> yes, because, you know, I think I'm, I'm very impressed with myself, too, that I've actually managed to time myself out to the um, to, to the right time. Done beautifully. Yeah, I know. I'm very impressed. Um, if anybody has any quick questions, anything to ask, if not, I guess we can. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to add? I don't think so. I think that pretty much covers most of the things. We didn't talk a lot about heart disease, but it's really just oh, yeah. Mediterranean style diet for heart disease, which is obviously uh, women are at much higher risk of postmenopausally. So really worth being conscious of that. So that's adding more vegetables, more fish. All the things we've talked about already, more yeah. vegetable, fish, nuts, seeds, olive oil, avocado, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Victoria is saying, thank you, Sophie. Fascinating. Oh, I'm so glad it's been useful and interesting. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, no, I think it really because it's it's a it's such a big topic, and there's just so much out there of everybody telling you, you know, you know, this is going to save your life, this is going to save your life, this is going to save your life. When really, actually, it probably needs to be a multi-pronged approach of all things really in balance with a good diet, a good lifestyle, mm -hmm. and um, and not that reliance of of one thing is going to make it all great for you. I know. And, you know, there's so much where, where there's, we say this all the time, don't we, Fiona, where there is desperation, there is predators trying to come and take advantage. And so what I would say is do your basics. So if you're not sure your diet's quite there, get your good quality A to Z in place. If you're not eating oily fish twice a week, get your omega threes in place. You might want to do that anyway. So do those two things, tick those boxes, work on your sleep hygiene, look after your diet as best you can. And if you do want to try some of the alternative remedies, and therapies just give them a go for a good month maybe even six weeks depending on what you, where you think you are in your menopausal cycle so that you've had it given it a good chance to work before you try something else and before you give up and think well, nothing's working everything's awful give it a bit of, ch of a chance to work and recognize that perhaps you know if it works for half of women you might not be in that half of women but there might be something else that will work further down the line for you yes that's true and that's the other thing too i mean it's not you know now being 57 and having gone through various different stages of perimenopause, menopause and postmenopause, 
it changes. This, you know, how much estrogen you need changes, how much of everything you need sort of changes. It's not what you do today um, is going to be the same in, in three years' time. You'll be constantly adjusting. Yeah, so much fun to come. <laughs> exactly, exactly, true. Brilliant. All right, look, thank you so very much for that. Gotcha. And um, and you can go and have your dessert now. Right. And <laughs> Exactly. And the rest of us can go and have our dinner. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and thank you very much to my son Alex, who is um, who very kindly sat through all of that as um, making sure that I didn't completely and utterly ruin it by not knowing what I'm doing technically. <laughs> oh, I'm I'm gonna up, you know. Thank you. <laughs> Yay! Brilliant. All right, I shall stop recording now, and thank you, everybody. And hopefully, these will be available to those who didn't manage to um, to.